is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Okay. Can I welcome members who are with us um, this afternoon in the meeting room? Um, it is uh, myself and Pat Sheehan here, or Sheehan, sorry. And can I welcome those who are joining the meeting remotely through video conference facility, um, the Deputy Chair, John Stewart, Emma Sheeran and Podrick Delargy. This committee, committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast through our Parliament buildings and online. Members, you are welcome to use your mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. They can connect to the Assembly Wi-Fi. If members are content to proceed through the agenda, um, I'll go directly to item number one. Apologies. Um, the clerk has received apologies from um, Alex Easton and Trevor Long. Any other apologies? No. Okay, item number two, chairperson's business. Um, I have a few items in the chair's business. Um, firstly, an update, members, that on Monday, the 15th of November, I met with Mr. David McAllister, MEP, and Mr. Bernd Lang, MEP, who are the co-chairs of the European Parliament UK Coordination Group, which leads the European Parliament on UK issues. Uh, at the meeting, I spoke um, on the importance of transparency in the UK-EU negotiations and for the views of Northern Ireland to be taken into account. Uh, the meeting was very, very short. Um, it uh, was delayed considerably in starting, uh, and obviously uh, members will know that we had to um, go quickly to the Assembly floor as there was um, a, a statement from uh, the Deputy First Minister in relation to uh, the mother and babies report. So um, does Pat or Emma want to maybe share, they also attended, do they want to share any observations on that meeting? Um, it, it was a, a short meeting, but I suppose it was useful and uh, I suppose the MEPs expressed a certain amount of frustration uh, <clears throat> in regard to certain quarters and certain parties. Um, but um, I, I think they will take away from the meeting the view that the most, most people here do support the protocol, uh, albeit there, there, there may need to be tweaks to the uh, operational running of the protocol. Uh, but certainly they flagged up one of the issues that the EU is, uh, has made a proposal on already around medicines and the hope that that can be resolved quite quickly. So um, it was a positive meeting from, from uh, the point of view of the EU being flexible and being in uh, solution finding mode. So uh, all in all, it was a good meeting, I thought. It's disappointing that uh, some of the other member, committee members didn't attend, but there you go. Okay. I see Diane Dodd yeah. has her hand up. Yeah, sorry, Diane, can I bring you into the spotlight? Are you... Is it... Is it oh, Sophia, is it... Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, Diane, you had your hand up. Okay, sorry. Um... um I sort of thought Emma had come into the spotlight, but anyway, um, we'll, we'll just give it a go. I um, met uh, the two MEPs earlier um, at the, the previous discussion just before the TO committee one, so I'm presuming it wasn't much uh, different. But I do want to put on record that I did find them in listening mode, um, and I indicated it's so important to actually listen um, and that the issues um, were not just about trade. The issues were also about consent and the consent mechanism and that core kernel of um, the Belfast Agreement, which is uh, about consent from both unionists and nationalists, and reminded the MEPs that they were in a democratically elected house where not one member from the unionist community supported the Northern Ireland Protocol and that that must give um, rise to grave concern to the European Union, that that delicate balance as envisaged by uh, the Belfast Agreement has been turned on its head and unfortunately people in this committee and um, indeed 
um, pro uh, protocol uh, believers in in the assembly seem to think that that's just fine and dandy. Um, so um, I, we raised the issue of consent. We also raised the issue of the democratic deficit. The protocol not only uh, imposes trade restrictions within our UK internal market, but it actually also um, has a huge democratic deficit. Northern Ireland is subject to laws that it cannot alter, that it cannot change, and that simply has to accept. And those laws accepted from the European Union will over time cause divergence between us and our biggest market. And we are already seeing that in uh, Northern Ireland firms being less competitive in the GB market um, than they are and than they would have been previously. So there are huge problems, not just right now with the protocol in terms of trade and um, checks and, and, and so on, but there are problems around that issue of consent. There are also those problems around the democratic deficit. Sorry, I just wanted to, to outline what the contribution was um, from my party, lest anybody should think that uh, the DUP didn't bother to turn up to, to talk to the MEPs, but I had a very good in-depth conversation. Thank you. Yes, Diana was aware you were actually in uh, the room before we arrived. So can I bring Emma Sheeran into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Chair. It was just basically to, to follow up on, I suppose, on the contributions from both yourselves and yourself and Pat. I know that we were all uh, meeting uh, with the MEPs together. And just to comment, I, I understand that Diane has outlined there the position that she gave to the MEPs. But um, I, I noted with interest that they, when we were leaving the room, said to us that they found that, you know, they could work with and could find uh, ground to, to work on with ourselves and Sinn Féin, the SDLP and the Alliance parties, whereas uh, what they were getting from the unionist parties was negativity and no to everything. And I think that sort of um, outlines in very sharp focus the attitude post-Brexit and how, how people have been dealing with the consequences of what they voted for. So um, I just feel that that's important to record. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, and it is fair to say that there was uh, a great deal um, of, of concern from the EU reps. Um, uh, and <laughs> they, they're, they're quite clear that there is very little consensus here. Um, but I find that they listened respectfully to us as well uh, and um, were very much outreach in, in trying to support us uh, through some of the difficulties that we're currently experiencing. So can I move on to the second item under Chair's business? Uh, again, um, also on Monday the 15th of November, I had a meeting with Lord Canal and uh, Sir Oliver Heald, um, who are responsible for the coordination of the House of Lords and House of Commons delegation uh, for the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. I spoke uh, once again about the importance of the participation of devolved legislators and, um, in, in the PPA and the associated decision-making, particularly uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly, due to, obviously, its special circumstances. Um, so uh, that was a quite a robust um, you know, uh, briefing that, that, that I gave them in relation to that participation and transparency and good governance. Um, under Chair's business also, um, I want to inform members that have been invited to an event by the Institute of Government on labour shortages due to Brexit. And again, there's a bit of frustration uh, within me in order to adequately and effectively participate in such events, it is absolutely imperative that this committee seeks and receives more data on Brexit-related issues. Um, on this note, can I suggest to members that the committee should seek uh, data on Brexit-related skill shortages due, uh, due to the current situation? And in pursuant of, of this information, are we and can we agree um, to, in the first instance, establish if uh, this issue has been considered by the Committee for the Economy? And then, uh, secondly, if not, to ask the Assembly Research Services to carry out research on this particular issue um, of skill shortages. Agreement? Yeah? 
Right. Okay. Uh, and, and in my final item of Chair's business, can I uh, refer members to correspondence uh, from the Royal Irish Academy, which um, was on page 917 of the meeting pack. Uh, this paper refers uh, to higher education um, and, uh, and one of these papers in particular uh, drew my attention. The role of the regions and the place of higher education across the island of Ireland is in the documentation um, in the table pack. And so can I, on that basis, remind members of the commitment in the New Decade New Approach for regional balance uh, to expand the Ulster University McGee campus? Uh, and I refer particularly um, to the New Decade New Approach um, Appendix 1 under the Programme for Government, which falls under the remit of this uh, Executive Office, where it states on page 40, item number 12, that the Executive will bring forward proposals for the development and expansion of Ulster University campus at McGee College, including the necessary increase in maximum student numbers to realise 10,000 student camp campus target and a graduate entry medical school. So that's the stated uh, position within New Decade, New Approach. Uh, and it is the role and responsibility under the programme for government of this particular office. So can I seek agreement uh, to write to the department for an update on the progress of the full expansion of the McGee campus uh, to 10,000 students? Of course, uh, Chair. Uh, okay. And just the, the Graduate Entry Medical School has already opened, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, but that's one well, piece. That's a good start, isn't it? Good start, good start, but lots more to be done. Okay, thank you. So number, item number three is the draft minutes. Members, uh, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of November 2021 are on pages 6 to 14 of the meeting pack. Um, if you're content that the, members, or the mem minutes are a true reflection on the proceedings of the meeting, um, I'm happy to sign. Yeah. Okay. Matters arising. Has any members any matters arising on, based on the minutes? Okay. Yeah, Sinead, can I come on there? Yes, you can, Farag. Yeah. Uh, Sinead, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, can I hear you perfectly? No, it was just a suggestion to the committee. Um, obviously, we do have a lot of business to get through, and I think just as a way of streamlining the process, we have the correspondence and the pack. I know myself, I always take a good lot of time to read through that. So I would just suggest maybe for future meetings that we, we are all aware of the correspondence and that we can just move on from that rather than going over it again. Well, actually, Park, there is a substantial amount of correspondence in the pack. I think there's about 12 pieces in the pack. I have asked particularly that all correspondence are listed in detail, uh, and that's at my request as the chair. Thank you. Chair, could I come Yes, on? no, I, I, that's what I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but it is all in the pack. I'm just saying that during the meeting, rather than us going through it all at the meeting that members, I would agree with you, members all should be reading that before they come into the committee, just to make them aware. It just means that we can streamline and spend more time talking to the, the guests who come on each week. Could I come in? Just okay, back of right. Yeah. Uh, I agree uh, with, with what Podrick's saying. Uh, and, and a lot of the committees that I have sat on previously, mm -hmm. Well, the correspondence is there and it's dealt with as an item and um, we don't go through each individual item of correspondence yeah. but members are free to raise any of the correspondence that they think it might be pertinent to raise at the time if it's important to the committee or if it's important uh, for whatever reason uh, it, it just it, it just means that correspondence rather than being a sort of lengthy item is, is condensed and if there are issues that are of importance to committee members, they can raise them, uh, including and, yourself, of and, course. And yeah, but there are items and correspondence that I may wish to bring into chairs, um, chairs' business, and um, I, I'm at liberty to do so. Oh, also, and I think for you know, whilst we as members receive the correspondence, there is a wider public out there that are looking to see transparency, good governance, and they want to see what. Uh, correspondence the committee are actually looking at. So I will 
always critique and uh, the, the correspondence at the end. So it's one of the last items on the agenda. I know we don't give it an awful lot of time because it is the last item on the agenda, but if there's anything particularly important, I will pull it through into Chairman's business, but I will critique it and call it out at the end of the meeting so that the public realise what correspondence that this committee is dealing with. And I think that that's good governance uh, and a good way to be open uh, democracy for, for everyone else. Thank you. Okay. So, item number five, Truth Recovery Design Panel. Okay. Can I refer members to pages 16 to 638 of the meeting pack and pages of the table pack for the relevant papers? And can I welcome uh, Deidre Mahan, Director of Women and Children's Services and the Executive Director of Social Work and the Health and Social Care in Northern Ireland, Professor Philip Scratton, Professor Emitris of um, Queen's University Belfast, and Dr Maeve O'Rourke, lecturer in Human Rights, NUI Galway. You're all very, very welcome. Can I advise you that this session is not being recorded by Hansard? However, uh, the video will be available on the committee website. And uh, you're all very welcome here um, this afternoon. And uh, from the outset, can I thank you for the work that you have undertaken so far. It's extremely valuable work um, for, for everybody um, in, in Northern Ireland, but particularly um, the victims of those mother and babies institutions right across, um, well, Northern Ireland in particular, but right across um, the, these islands. Before your briefing, I think uh, it would be helpful not only to say that there seems to be unity across the Assembly for the panel's proposals, but also that there is unity between members from different religious and non-religious backgrounds in absolutely condemning the appalling, appalling treatment of women and girls and young children by the institutions involved. The homes are an appalling indictment of the nature of our past society and the way victims of sexual crimes were treated and the structure of just complete horrible um, misogyny that infiltrated and was throughout our society um, for, for many, many decades. And I believe we still uh, have a battle on our hands in, in regard it. I think that there is little that makes me probably more angry and upset than the way women and babies were treated by the institutions on this island. So can I invite Deirdre, Bill and Maeve to make their presentations? Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for inviting us here today. Um, can I just say at the outset that we're absolutely delighted on behalf of victims and survivors that the Northern Ireland Executive have accepted in totality all. Monday was really a momentous day for them and for Northern Ireland when those, those women and their now adult children paying it for so long and credit needs to go to them for achieving one of their interim goals. They have a long way to go yet but it's a very positive start. Um, thank you also to all the MLAs and local councillors and other organisations who supported the victims and survivors in, in our work. Now we move to the challenging task of making these recommendations become a reality. However, Chair, there is one point of clarification that I would like to mention and then my colleagues will emphasise. The media have recommendation for a public inquiry Sorry. and whilst Excuse we have of course Deirdre, Deirdre um, we've got a bit of yes. problem we've got a bit of problem with your speaker um, oh. your connection is is falling in and out is there anything that we can do from our end knock off her camera I know it's not ideal yeah Deirdre you probably will I'm need to off the calendar. yeah knock off the camera if at all possible okay when when did you last hear me well, it just was, uh, we, we've got the gist, but we, if you want to maybe start back at the beginning again, uh, Deirdre, just so that okay. I think what you have to say is very important. And, and I know uh, a lot of victims and survivors are listening in today. 
Okay, I'll, I'll start again. Um, so could I say at the outset, can you hear me clearly now with the yes, camera off? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, that we're delighted on behalf of victim survivors that the executive have accepted all the recommendations. And Monday was a momentous day for them and for Northern Ireland when those voices who were silenced for so long finally felt heard. We would not be here without those women and their now adult children tirelessly campaigning for so long. And credit needs to go to them today for achieving one of their interim goals. They have a long way to go yet, but it's a very positive start. Thank you also to all the MLAs and local councillors and all our organisations who supported the victims and survivors in their work. Now we move to the challenging tasks of making these recommendations become reality. However, there is one point of clarification, Chair. The media have been reporting on our recommendation for a public inquiry, which we have, of course, recommended. But we have, in fact, recommended an integrated approach, which includes an independent panel. Our, my colleagues and the other panel members will explain the relationship between these two and our submission to yourself today. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Mabel Rourke, who will describe all our recommendations, and then Professor Phil Scraton will explain in more detail the role of the independent panel, and then we will take questions, Chair, if that's okay. Um, so we'll just hand over to Maeve now at this stage. Thank you. She's not there, she's dropped off. Maeve has actually dropped off, Deirdre. Um, oh, she's back. Oh, she's back. Okay. She's back. <laughs> she's back. Okay, thank you. Maeve, I just hand it over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I lost connection at the same time as Deirdre, unfortunately, there. So assuming you can all hear me okay, I'm extremely glad to be here today um, and for your time. And um, I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to focus in particular on the integrated truth investigation part of our recommendations. But just to summarize, of course, as you'll know, there are five key recommendations that we make. Number one, the adoption of guiding principles that will um, apply to every measure uh, that forms part of this entire endeavor, derived straight from uh, what the survivors told us. Um, but also, as you'll see in chapter 11, um, from our um, evaluation of comparative processes in different jurisdictions. When something uh, has the potential to become quite unwieldy and when the matters at stake are so important, the adoption of guiding principles seems to be um, quite an important thing to do. Second of all, a recommendation which we are really thrilled has been accepted, that responsibility for the endeavour would be placed at the very highest um, and centralised level within the executive office. Third, the integrated truth investigation, which I'll come back to. Fourth, access to records, which involves three components, a very immediate need for a statutory preservation requirement um, in law, requiring preservation and prohibiting with criminal penalty the destruction of any relevant records, given that they are held in myriad locations. Uh, second of all, the progression of guidance for data controllers on how to actually implement personal data protection legislation that is already in place. And thirdly, very importantly, but something that will come once the independent panel is set up and working with survivors um, legislation to create a permanent archive that gives a permanent home to all of the work that has been done through the inquiry to gather records um, so that into the future, just like has been done in other jurisdictions, for example, with the Stasi Records Agency in Germany, with the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, there would actually be a permanent centre of information provision and education um, to guarantee non-repetition of similar abuses in the future. Fifth of all, redress, reparation and compensation. It's extremely welcome to see the commitment to providing redress at the beginning um, of the process of truth telling. And this is something that does have precedent in other jurisdictions. Of course, the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse in the Republic of Ireland operated alongside a residential institution's redress board. Um, and in Scotland, there have been efforts to provide early interim redress payments before coming to the end of an investigation. And um, so to return to the third 
recommendation. Um, as Deirdre mentioned, there has been quite a bit of focus on the fact that we did recommend on foot of survivors clear views, uh, a public inquiry, but it's part of a two stage integrated process of inquiry. And the first part, which does not require legislation, um, which must start immediately is the independent panel. So an independent panel and statutory public inquiry have different powers and therefore they do have different possibilities and purposes. And we're saying because of the complexity of the issues and the views of survivors and their diversity, it actually makes sense that these procedures would work together rather than having to choose one over the other. And there are many things that the independent panel can get to work on immediately that will then feed into and indeed reduce some of the burden of work on the ultimate public inquiry. Many survivors stated that they wish to provide testimony in a non-adversarial forum. In other words, they do not wish to be put under cross-examination by a judge or by legal representatives for the institutions and agencies or professionals concerned. They wish to provide their testimony in a way that they have control over, some in public, some in private, some wishing their testimony to be permanently preserved for the education of future generations. And an independent panel has great flexibility in how it goes about gathering evidence. But of course, an independent panel has limitations. It cannot exercise any legal powers because it doesn't have statutory underpinning um, to require the production of records or require the production of testimony that isn't voluntarily given. That's where a public inquiry comes in. Um, also, a statutory public inquiry can name individuals because its procedures allow those who might be criticised to be legally represented. This, of course, is one of the limitations of a panel, whereas people may wish to give their evidence in public and indeed did so in Canada through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in public in a non-adversarial way, it may not be possible for them to name individual alleged wrongdoers in public as they're doing it. So um, it's a matter of thinking creatively, albeit of course within the bounds of the law in terms of what the independent panel can do and get to doing straight away. Um, the panel members um, according to survivors and our research um, should include people from a range of disciplinary areas. Um, appointments should be made from a list of nominations, a short list created by survivors. This is all within our recommendations. Um, and the panel should consult regularly with a forum of survivors and relatives, including those in the diaspora. And the creation of such a forum is, of course, a very immediately needed step because that forum of survivors and relatives will be involved in creating that shortlist of the individuals who will actually make up the independent panel. We recommend that the independent panel members um, also include uh, individuals with lived experience. So what work do we recommend this independent panel doing? Bearing in mind, it comes immediately and then feeds into the work of a statutory public inquiry, which will need legislation, so therefore will take more time to become operational. An independent panel will gather and catalogue as many records and archives as it possibly can within existing legal powers and the voluntary contribution um, that is required. Um, and that would be across jurisdictions to the extent possible. It would, so importantly, assist victim survivors and relatives to obtain information. This actually would be quite groundbreaking in terms of what inquiries in this field would do. It is clear that survivors and relatives need the assistance of archivists, genealogists, advocates, legal advocates where necessary to assist them in gathering records. And also the independent panel needs to begin to understand what are the barriers that still face people in this respect. The independent panel should search for unmarked graves, again, to the extent that it can, without additional legal powers. It should hear testimony in a venue and in a manner tailored to the individual wishes of survivors and relatives. And it should investigate and make findings with a focus on human rights violations and on the systemic harms that were suffered and on the nature of the harms that were suffered. So you can see that the independent panel is really about allowing survivors and relatives to fully inform in the way that they are most comfortable doing 
of the systemic harms that then would inform the more granular investigations of a public inquiry in due course, which of course would also involve naming potentially alleged wrongdoers and naming individual institutions. Um, the independent panel would recommend issues for the public inquiry to further investigate to the extent that it could not get to the bottom of issues. And very importantly, as an overall measure, the independent panel through also its collaboration with its forum of survivors and relatives would keep a watching brief on how well all of the recommendations of our process are being implemented. So I will stop there and um, thank you very much and look forward to your questions. Um, okay. Thanks. So, um, Sally's been very involved in the panel, panel and um, in the health fair and other ones might. Um... Okay, I'll. Um... Oh? Yeah, okay, it's, uh, we can't hear you exactly, Deirdre, it keeps breaking up. Um, oh, dear. So, I, I, I assume everybody can hear me okay, right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fine. Thank you. Um, the first thing to say uh, very quickly, and it's only a matter of course, it's not really that interesting, but my name is Phil Sprayton, so I'm not Philip, I'm Phil, and I'm Sprayton, not Spratton. Um, oh, and it's, Apologies it, on both. No, 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 don't worry. It was a double, it was a double whammy, and um, I much appreciated getting, you, you getting them both. But no, everybody calls me Spratton. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, what does matter is that um, I, I have little more to say, really. I want to get to the questions. Uh, I have little more to say than Maeve has already outlined in terms of the panel. I will just say one thing, that obviously in relation to the, um, the construction of an independent panel, the media have had a really difficult time getting their heads around this. And, and I think quite a few of uh, of those uh, of Stormont have had a bit of trouble getting their heads around it as well, precisely because it is something that is relatively new. Uh, the, first, uh, the first independent panel that was held was the Hillsborough Independent Panel, and as many of you know, that ended over 20 years of controversy around the Hillsborough disaster, and it demonstrated what you could do if you had an independent panel of very carefully selected contributors who would go into all of the documentation that was available at that time. In fact, in Hillsborough, it was, it was documentation from over 80 institutions, over 10,000 documents uh, were, were eventually downloaded, 2 million were consulted. Um, so an independent panel has that opportunity to delve into that material. The other issue is that uh, a further independent panel was, uh, was appointed on the Jersey Homes Inquiry and what that independent panel did was took evidence. It didn't actually go into a lot of detailed historic evidence in writing. Uh, it, it took oral evidence from people who, on the one hand, did want to be, those who'd been abused in the homes did want to be uh, identified, but also from those who didn't want to be identified. So it, it gives an opportunity for people to come before a panel, tell their truth, have their truth listened to and not be examined by smart lawyers who would be representing other institutions. It's purely a truth-telling exercise. And of course, what it gives is legitimacy to those stories, as Maeve has already out outlined. Uh, the importance of that is that if you actually wait for a statutory inquiry before you hear that evidence, then much of that evidence is subject to examination. And that puts many people off giving that evidence. So that's why we have recommended the two. They're not, as Maeve has illustrated, they're not, they're, they're distinct, but then they are integrated. The idea that one, as the phrase we used, leads into the other. And obviously for the statutory public inquiry, there will need to be legislative change. And as Maeve has already said, we don't need that um, to appoint an independent panel. So that is the core of, of what we're saying. Most of the media have missed it. Most of the political statements have missed it. It is unique. It has never been done before in any of the islands, but it hasn't even been done internationally. There has never before been 
this kind of a process where uh, a, a fully independent panel of in inverted experts working with uh, representatives of, uh, of families and survivors working alongside them takes that evidential base and that evidential base becomes the foundation um, for the public inquiry. Uh, as I say, it is unique, it would work, it would be uh, an excellent contribution, but the most important thing, again, as Maeve has said, is it puts uh, the families and survivors front and center of the process, and we know that all of you are uh, committed to that. Uh, this also connects very clearly to the, the, the really difficult problem that has occurred for many families, which is open access to all their records. That's our fourth, fourth recommendation. And it is important that that is, as a matter of urgency, established. We are to understand that this is already in process, but it's absolutely crucial that families have direct access uh, to all of their records. It's their lives. It's, their, it's the lives of loved ones. And the cavalier way in which that has happened up to now, some not getting access, some getting access, um, but being monitored in all that access, not being able to take away records, not being able to copy, that's all got to go. Uh, these records relate directly to their lives and they've lived, with the, they've lived with this trauma for so many years. And it's just a basic, a basic human right, I believe, that we all should be able to identify all of those documents that, that, that relate to our background and our birth, our background and our development. And of course, the, the final issues are around in, in the fifth recommendation, as Maeve has already indicated, are redress, reparation and compensation. Uh, compensation is always a tricky issue in these matters, as I know only too well from all the rest of my work, because it is often assumed that people are seeking financial redress uh, simply because they want to somehow gain access to funding. That is not the case at all. The issue is that all people who have been wronged and so seriously and severely wronged must receive uh, compensation for that wrong. That can be instituted immediately by uh, early payments and then in the longer term with full assessment. Uh, that is part of the process of redress and, repar uh, and, and reparation, uh, as would be permanent memorials to, to, to this hideous period in our history. Only then can we begin to demonstrate and recognize the wrongs that have been done. But I have to say this, we can never ever put back the pain. We can never ever put back the hurt. What we can do, and, and therefore, I would encourage all members in all of their conversations with anybody to avoid the word closure. There can be no closure on such horrific, horrible, dreadful circumstances of history. Um, what there can be is some form of reparation and redress, some form of satisfaction of access to, um, to, to, to justice. But there can never, ever, we can never put back the clock on the suffering that all of those families who gave their time to us, uh, shared their lives with us, their experiences with us over the last six months. And that is the foundation of the work that you have before you. And it is a tremendous uh, compliment to their fortitude that they came and they put their trust in these three people. And we promised them that we would never break that trust. And we believe now that we've arrived at a situation um, where that collective responsibility being taken across the, across the floor in government is going to bring about at least some form of redress. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much um, to the panel for um, your words. And, um, and thank you, uh, Professor Phil, for actually taking the time to explain um, the dual process and how integrated it is, because it's really important um, for the public to be aware of this uh, and how one is codependent and the other 
um, but can happen um, immediately, uh, the, 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 the truth panel and the, that as well. So, yes, there is no closure. Um, there is intergenerational uh, pain that goes uh, with these experiences uh, from the victims and survivors. One of the questions that I would like to ask is, what has been the engagement uh, from the institutions um, and which institutions are fully engaged uh, and, and, and perhaps which institutions are not? And did you gain a feeling um, that they accept blame and responsibility? And I suppose a second part of that question would be, how confident um, can we be that the institutions fully support the redress uh, payments and actually meet the, both their legal and moral responsibilities? Um, I, I know that we have experience here with the historical institutional abuse process and that causes me concern. Chair, maybe I'll take the first part of that question, um, if you may. Can you hear me now? I've taken up my earphones. I thought maybe that would be easier. Well, we hear you now, uh, Deirdre. Sorry for that yeah. problems earlier. Thanks. That's okay. Um, so um, we haven't actually engaged any of the institutions, Chair. Our, our job was to work with victims and survivors to um, decide what what the terms of reference of the next stage would be and what the next stage would look like. So we haven't actually directly involved ourselves with any of the institutions um, except so I, you know um, I will say that the piece of research that was called out called, um, that was done sorry by Queen University and Austria University did difficulty in access and records for their research from some of the church institutions um, so whether that has changed in the last year uh, remains to be seen when we move into the next stage of the independent panel the independent panel obviously will begin their work um, begin their research begin to try and um, locate records and it'll be at that point where we will know whether the institutions will, will cooperate or not at that stage but it's too early for us to say i don't know if Maeve and phil want to add anything to that Um, I might, I, I can jump in and, and add, I, I, I would actually add on the second question because I, I agree with everything Deirdre is saying there and, and would re-emphasise, yes, that um, the academics whose report preceded our work, you know, very clearly attest to the difficulties in accessing records. So it's not a good sign. And that's why the preservation requirement in, in a small um, amendment to some bill going through or a standalone piece of emergency legislation is so important. Um, on the second question of how confident can you be of the religious participating in reparation, um, all I would say there, because I do lack um, extensive experience on the ground in Northern Ireland and have my experience more in the Republic of Ireland um, with the religious orders, um, is that I think access to records is the absolute key in enabling people to go to court to the extent that they are able to anymore, of course. It's difficult, perhaps not impossible, depending on the case. Um, and I mean civil court, but access to records is the reason that people can't get there. Yeah. They cannot access at present their own personal files that demonstrate who knew what, what happened to people, is there a consent form for an adoption, for example. Um, and not only do they need their personal records, they actually need access to the administrative archive. Because without the access to the administrative files, they can't see who knew what was going on at a general level. Therefore, you know, that goes to questions of um, compliance with the duty of care, negligence, what have you. Um, so that's what I would add, that if there is a desire to assist people in holding the institutions to account, access to records is absolutely a fundamental requirement to enable anybody, to the extent there is still any chance of getting to court. 
Yeah, and I, I obviously concur with what uh, both uh, Deirdre and Maeve have said. Um, I think one thing that can be done in, the, in, in very short time is that there could be an approach made by, um, by the executive uh, or on behalf of the executive to all institutions. And we're not just talking about religious institutions, we're talking about other institutions such as Bernardo's, um, where there were any involvement, where, where any involvement took place with the, with, with the homes. And that that approach could be uh, a request or even a demand that those institutions do not dispose of any, re any um, of the records that they currently hold. One of the things that, in my experience, one of the things that happens in situations like this is that uh, organizations deny that they have the records, they deny that they kept them, they were incomplete, whatever. And then when they are forced, usually by legislation, when they're forced to reveal, suddenly the records appear. Uh, and that is because institutions historically do keep records and they keep records for obvious reasons in terms of any cases that might come up uh, against them in terms of those who are in their care. But I, I would think that there is no reason, and I think this is a, a, a really significant issue, there's no reason why that issue of access cannot be addressed immediately with an approach to all organizations uh, to preserve all that they have. Um, thank you for that. Um, in our experience here of dealing with victims and survivors of the historical institution abuse, while the redress process was promised to be very much victim-centered, it actually turned out to be uh, legalistic and, and very um, unresponsive. How can we avoid that actually happening in this case? And what learnings can we take from what has gone before us? Um, maybe I'll start with that again, okay. Chair. I mean, one of our recommendations is in detail is that, that, that there is a consultation forum set up led by victims and survivors. And we have also suggested that that consultation forum decide in what way the redress scheme should work and that, that they take some control of that because you're absolutely right. We do not want to repeat uh, mistakes of the past. This can't be added on to already existing redress schemes that are very legalistic and led by lawyers and, and, and judges. Uh, so um, there are different models throughout the world that maybe the, the consultation forum can look at as to how best that might work. I understand that there does require some small legislation uh, in relation to the redress screen to make sure that it, it doesn't impact on um, people's benefits. Um, but um, we definitely want the consultation forum to be in some degree of control of that. Yeah. Deirdre, yeah, we're, wanted... we're still experiencing problems with the sound from Deirdre as well. She's breaking up a little bit. I'll keep my camera off okay. in that. I'm just going to hand it over to Maeve. So it's, it's really about the, the consultation forum being in control of that. But I see Maeve was jumping in and Phil was jumping in. So whoever wants to speak first. Thanks very much, Deirdre. And I'll be quick and hand over to Phil. Um, so, yeah, on that particular question, although, of course, it is something there has to be consultation with, and that's why the forum that is set up as part of the independent panel will be able to serve many different functions. Um, it's perhaps worth noting a few things about the previous schemes in the Republic of Ireland, um, and others may then have views on the heart, uh, the one that followed the heart inquiry, for example. Um, certainly with the Residential Institutions Redress Board in the Republic of Ireland, there was actually, in my view, no need for it to be as adversarial as it was. And that was a real failing that the government, I think, capitulated to the institution's desire to be able to cross-examine every single allegation of abuse, even though the legislation said no award is evidence of wrongdoing. So it was an ex gracia scheme, meaning it doesn't recognize wrongdoing. And people, it was held in confidence, in entire confidence. And um, so I think there really does need to be extreme scrutiny 
in relation to what procedures are actually required when you have a scheme that, you know, if it is to be ex gratia, if it is not actually, you know, a court, and it's recognized that these payments are tokens rather than full, um, because they invariably are not full and complete uh, assessed damages, then you really need to be very careful about applying the kind of court procedures that would otherwise operate. And um, the other thing about the Magdalene laundry scheme that we learned was where there are not records, and actually even where there are, they may not be accurate. That has been found um, by an independent decision maker installed in the Department of Justice on foot of an ombudsman's report about maladministration of the Magdalene laundry scheme in the South. They may not be accurate. They may not actually have been compiled accurately at the time, for example, because no one wanted it to be on paper that child sex abuse victims were being taken out of school and put into Magdalene laundry so that they wouldn't, quote unquote, have an influence on the children around them in the school. But that wasn't obviously how things were supposed to work. So it's very important, not necessarily to get rid of all of lawyers altogether, perhaps to provide them to the victims for the purpose of swearing an affidavit so that they have sworn evidence that can be accepted as the evidence of what happened to them, of their duration of stay, because otherwise you invariably end up lying on the alleged wrongdoers. Um, and the final thing to say in relation to redress is that the UN Committee Against Torture has found in a recent decision in the case of Elizabeth Coppin versus Ireland that it is not permissible to force people to wave away their rights to go to court, their rights to accountability when you are dealing with inhuman or degrading treatment as a matter of international law. And so what can be done instead, I think, is if people did succeed in court at a later date, then to the extent they have been paid some money by the government, that can be reduced from their award, if any, against the state. And that is the way to deal with the issue of some people wanting to go to court. You cannot force people to waive away their right to accountability, to waive their right to their child, to assert that they had a right to custody of their child. That is just not something that should be continuing anymore as a practice. Yeah, very quickly, and um, just to echo exactly what um, May has has just said. Um, I mean, I've I've lived here in the north for uh, sixteen years, seventeen years now, and uh, understand the failings of heart um, very well. I understand the failings of heart in terms of the the awaiting uh, redress uh, from many of the families, um, because I know those families, and I I think I want to make one thing clear that we were aware of that as a panel and when you look at the recommendations that we've made there are eight recommendations just on redress reparation and compensation alone there are over 70 re recommendations throughout the five key recommendations so sub recommendations if you like and i think that um we have to avoid uh the the mistakes after heart and and, and that are continuing to today we have to avoid that, and the, and and we've had those approaches to us um, from from many of the families and survivors because they are very well aware of the problems that have been faced. And so I, all I would say is I I would recommend that everybody reads closely reads the sub recommendations within the five main principles because I think there we've attempted to detail to to provide a blueprint. Um, for what should happen next. I think this was a really important part of the work uh, and, and obviously it was difficult because we had such a short period of time to do all of this in. But uh, we felt that we had to cover all the bases in terms of the way in which a financial redress scheme uh, would be developed, how it would be in cons consultation with victim survivors. One of those major issues is that people's existing benefit, uh, uh, access to benefits should not be in any way disturbed by any uh, interim payments that they receive. They are all, those comments are just made, not made off the cuff. They're made because we have listened to the, the, uh, the families and survivors in this situation, but we've also learned from the deficiencies post heart. 
And I think that is, 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 is an issue that, 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 that I would want to emphasize. And obviously, the three of us would be encouraging whoever is appointed at the next stage, we'll be encouraging them to think in those terms. And that's what I, I meant before when this is a, a completely unique start again situation. Uh, and I just wish that some of those key elements that we uh, progressed here could have been there for those who uh, endured the heart inquiry, many of whom have said they wish they had never actually gone before it. Um, thank you very much. Can I hand over to John Stewart, Deputy Chair, um, for questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, did you feel me if I'm not going to be technical devotees too, so it's either you hear me or see me. I think it's probably better that you hear me today. So uh, thank you for the evidence you've given so and the information you've given so far. Um, I did miss a little bit of it just because of the back and forward. So apologies if I cover something that you covered as well. Um, one of the key things I think, and I'm sure you'll agree with me in terms of a victim-centered process in any shape or form, is the communication and keeping victims and survivors updated. And I think it is with regret again, probably no, no fault of your own, but like today I was speaking to a few of them and just letting you know that you were coming to the committee today and the fact that they hadn't heard that, they were upset um, and they felt that there remains a void or a, a, an inability to communicate with victims and survivors. Um, and they've uh, um, and just in terms of that, do you think that there's a, an option or a, there would be a, um, a recommendation to have a designated person or team to communicate and liaise and update victims on a regular basis about what exactly is going on? Because they are living it, as you know, every day. Um, and I think they feel quite often that things are happening that they don't hear about. I'm just interested to get your feeling on that, first of all. Um, maybe I'll comment on that. Um, hopefully, if if you hear me, I've turned off my, my camera. I've got you, yeah. John, let's see if that's a bit easier. Yeah, I mean, communication is, is always a big challenge. And certainly, as we finished our work um, in early October, um, but obviously for for the victims and survivors, this work is only beginning. Uh, we did send out a link this morning um, uh, for them to, to watch um, um, so what they were on today. Um, we the, we I I met with um, TEO this morning just to talk through how they are going to access all the um, contacts that we have built up over the last six months, um, and obviously there's a um, you know privacy and data protection issue there that we we need to figure out. Um, but most of the survivors have given their permission for their um, details to be passed on. Um, so as soon as uh, TEO get that sorted out really, really quickly, they're, as far as I understand, are recruiting staff for this as we speak um, to make sure that um, there is some sort of continuity and um, system for communication. But again, as I said earlier on, the sooner that they can set up the consultation forum, that that becomes a conduit for communications to all victims and survivors, and that there is then a group that um, whoever is leading on the independent panel has got a, a group to communicate with regularly. So those systems need to happen as a matter of urgency. So it is crucially, crucially important, John, absolutely. Okay. You know, all good work can be undone if, if um, we lose that communication. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Um, to move on to the next point, you, we discussed um, whether it's the institutions or the need to have information readily available. Um, I'm just wanting to see if what you thought about the notion of what could be better done to start a dialogue, a dialogue um, in from, uh, ahead of um, cooperation um, cross-border in terms of that information sharing between the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland government. Um, obviously, there's going to be the need to have that communication there to ensure all information flow is there. Um, just wondering what you think would be best to move that forward. Maeve, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yes, I think one thing is that the preservation order actually needs to be a preservation order in legislation north and south. So in discussions that has to be conveyed, um, I don't think that there is anything in the Republic of Ireland that requires um, the religious orders to preserve everything that they have, not yet. 
There will be one in relation to adoption records in the birth information and tracing bill, but I think that it's possibly not broad enough. But I suppose that's at least a start and there should be discussion about that. I don't see why it shouldn't be identical. Um, in terms of then accessing the records, that is a um, somewhat complicated matter, I think. And that's why the independent panel's efforts and their interactions with survivors in making all efforts they can to access records north and south are going to be so important because it's so complex. It's very difficult for survivors and relatives and the general public to access information in the south. And, and all the reasons why need to be brought to light by the independent panel. And my view is that there is a requirement for legislation to produce records in the south that then can be used in the north as well. Um, and I and others have been doing lots of work to try to encourage the Irish government to legislate to open archives because all the archives of previous inquiries are not available to the general public and only in a very limited way through personal data access to survivors. Um, and I'd be glad actually to be in touch with anyone who kind of wants more detail on that. But I, I think in our recommendations, the purpose of the independent panel and its interactions with survivors who know so much about what's going on with records. That's so important because the independent panel can then advise both the public inquiry of what it needs to command production of, although of course it won't have powers to command production of things from the South, maybe the religious orders, even if they're holding things in the South, their Northern representatives can be commanded, that's one thing. But in terms of even state files from the South, they could be voluntarily produced. But if there's arguments about, oh, we can't, something sealed, legislation sealed it, a decade ago because it was part of some investigation, there will be need for legislation. So it's very complicated. And that's what we hope the independent panel will get to the bottom of. And I just emphasize again that we did recommend that part of the independent panel's expertise is archives, data access, genealogy, and all of those relevant skills. Okay. Thanks, Lamy. That's that's very helpful. Um, just moving on to my, my, my next issue, I think um, many victims, and myself included, and many others, will have been horrified and angered by the um, serious lack and redress scheme that was announced in the Republic of Ireland yesterday. And with that in mind, I'm just wondering what the panel's views are on the announcement from the Republic of Ireland yesterday on the redress scheme and the ridiculous notion that babies younger than six months who wouldn't remember their time in an institution and therefore payments are only made to babies who are now adults who spent more than six months in a home. Surely you think that it takes away from the many years of suffering and trauma as a result that these people suffered in adulthood and has to be something that couldn't possibly be considered here. John, we're absolutely appalled at that. And I know I was talking to Maeve yesterday and she's so angry with that. I don't know. I know Phil was trying to get in there before to say something else, I don't know if you Want to say something on that, Maeve, and then Phil? Because I know that you're all over this. Um, I think that the clear problem here is that the Commission of Investigation, followed by the government in the design of its redress, um, has failed to actually acknowledge the key harm that was done and the biggest and most serious human rights violation that happened, which is forced and unlawful separation, denial of consent through incarceration, institutionalization, all forms of exploitation, including forced labor, denying people the actual money that they might need to live elsewhere and um, all manner of psychological coercion. So the, the separation of mother and child is not recognized as a harm in what the government announced yesterday. The Mother and Baby Homes Commission found it did not find evidence of forced adoption, non-consensual separation, incarceration, forced labour generally, highly problematic findings, currently under challenge through High Court Judicial Review proceedings, including by Philomena Lee, who everybody knows. So what we aimed to do in our recommendations and what, you know, if these recommendations are implemented, can be so transformative of the process in Northern Ireland is actually to understand that the key harm under investigation is unlawful and forced family separation, which never stopped, is ongoing. 
Absolutely. Which is why, in turn, the very first thing we said the independent panel needs to do is to help people actually access their identity. Because you're actually dealing with an ongoing situation of human rights abuse. And the first thing the inquiry needs to see is that. Okay, thank you for that, Maeve. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in. Bill, do you, do you want to speak on that? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say, because I know that Maeve would not say it herself, is that one of the great uh, assets we had on our panel here was, was Maeve herself, uh, primarily because of her, uh, her all-Ireland perspective, particularly her knowledge in the South. I mean, she is the foremost person, as far as I'm concerned, on these issues. Now, if we are looking at which we should be doing uh, with how we deal with the cross-border links that you've just, um, you've just described, John, then Maeve is the person who should be consulted. I do okay. believe, and so what, however that is done, and I'm, I, it's, I'm not imposing something on Maeve that she doesn't know I'm going to say, <laughs> it is absolutely crucial that the knowledge base that we had for this panel, which was so strong because of her presence with that knowledge in the South, is now put to good use to avoid those very issues that, or that very issue that occurred yesterday, and there will be others. Um, so I think whatever, however we go forward with the consultative panel, however we go forward with the next set of procedures, that uh, we should bear in mind um, that, that Maeve's uh, expertise is there to be drawn on. And I noticed that she's just dropped off as I said that. <laughs> <laughs> You've scared her off, Phil. <laughs> um, thanks for that, Bill. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that point, and and hopefully, um, we will drop back in. The actual question, the last question I had, Chair, if I may, was actually to me because she had mentioned it, but I'm sure the two of you can cover it. And it was around the ex gratia payments that are going on in the Irish Republic, and I was just hoping you could assure us that compensation here will not be ex gratia, seen as a mere goodwill gesture, but an acknowledgement as essential and rightful compensation for all the misjustices suffered by victims. Um, and who can still retain their rights to publicly discuss their lived experiences. I mean, I, I, don't, I, just think, I think that just a mere goodwill gesture will not be acceptable and files would fall far, far short of what it needed to be. I'm conscious just to get a little bit of maybe thoughts on that, folks, if I may, to finish. Well, I'll be, as Maeve is just gathering her thoughts as she's gone back in, I'll just read you the, the actual uh, recommendation we made, that the fi financial redress scheme should be prioritised an automatic standardised payment and entitlement to further individually assessed payment. The scheme should include all women who spent time or gave birth in any of the institutions, and it should not be means tested, it should not compromise existing social welfare supports, and should not waiver, require waiver of legal rights, and it should apply to all. So that, uh, that is the that, that, that they're the recommendations we made, and obviously we stand by them. And okay. you've described it. What is what, what what is happening in the south is just uh, a denial of some of that, and we have to. Absolutely. I, I believe that we have to take it lock, stock, and barrel. You know that those recommendations are thought through in detail to avoid those very anomalies that you've just raised, John. Okay, thank you, that Phil. Um, folks, I'll, I'll let others come in. I really appreciate your time and your answers today. Appreciate it. All the best. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, John, for that. And I think we all looked uh, at horror at um, the RTE news last night. Um, and if there's a way not to do it, I think it was demonstrated last night, particularly for, for uh, victims and survivors. It was, it was hard watch. So next, uh, can we bring Emma Sheeran into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Chair, and I just want to begin by thanking Maeve, Phil and Deirdre for their presentation and the questions that they've answered thus far. Um, my first question sort of pertains to the, the point that was just being made there around the 26th government, the 26 county uh, government uh, proposals and the mistakes that were made by both the, the government and the commission, which has sort of, I suppose, been exacerbated now by the, the details of the proposed redress scheme, the fact that they've put such a short time limit um, or this this time criteria 
on um, on victims and excluded anyone that was in a home for only six months and I suppose anyone and, I, and I'm not um, someone that's trauma informed but anybody that is is trained in in the impact of trauma on people's lives will tell you that no matter how young you are when that trauma occurs it will have an impact on your life and for people who have been removed from their mothers at such young ages and moved into other families and have maybe spent time then wondering where they came from and their whole lives sort of narrated by that um this is just insult to, to injury um so i wanted to ask and i know there's reference to you know cross-border work um at the very outset in terms of your recommendations but i wanted to ask how much to the forefront that was to in your minds around what not to do uh, when you were looking at the mistakes that had been made south of the border um maybe i'll start I'll start on, on that, Emma, and let the uh, others come in. Um, 100%, I mean, I would say about 50% of our um, victims and survivors raised issues about cross-border um, access to records, the fact that they didn't know where they were from, their mummies was maybe from the north of Ireland and um, they were adopted from the south of Ireland. And, Vice versa, there were women who were from the south of Ireland who were placed in institutions in Northern Ireland and um, gave birth there. So it is a huge, huge issue. And one thing to to point out, which you know, without stating the obvious, is that when we had partition in the 1920s in 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 the north and south of Ireland were created, the churches didn't part, didn't separate. We have all Ireland institutions in churches. And, and remains today. So th that really it became a very complicated factor, particularly in relation to access to records and now in relation to redress. So as Phil said earlier on, we were very blessed to have Maeve on our panel because she was able to highlight to us what not to do because it's been done wrong, not just in the south of Ireland, but else, elsewhere across the world. Maeve has done a lot of research on this. So um, we were really at pains to make sure that whatever it is that we recommended um, was was the best that we could get, uh, you know, from what didn't happen, the, the least dirty alternative from what didn't happen elsewhere. We turned it around to say, no, well, we can't do that because when they did that, that didn't work or that didn't work. So so that was really, really important to us and the cross-border being a huge issue. But I'll let Phil and Maeve come in on that. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, hopefully everyone hear me okay. Um, so one huge issue that we and the survivors very clearly and being very well informed actually about what not to do, which is great. Um, one thing that we recommended that's so key is this joined up archive north and south that the legislation, the legislation for which would be designed and um, really on the recommendations of the independent panel with its forum of survivors, because ultimately there is actually a need to change some laws to clarify others. And that's actually needed north and south. And it would sustain the functioning of a permanent archive. And I go back and we mentioned in chapter 11, the example of the Stasi Records Agency in Berlin, for example, where the archivists work day by day with the legislation in one hand, which tells them exactly what people are entitled to. And it is information that names other people to the extent that they affected your life, because personal data is not just things that are only about you uh, and no one else, but it's information that involves you and someone else as well. And you both have the right to it. And that's what's often not understood, unfortunately. And um, the other things that we made sure to recommend and the survivors made sure to point out where the independent panel and the public inquiry need to have as their actual first job to assist people to obtain information. And that was not done in the Mother and Baby Homes Commission of Investigation. In fact, the terms of reference for the Mother and Baby Homes Commission in the South explicitly stated, this commission shall not intervene in anyone's efforts to trace a family member. And the commission itself chose then not to even give a single document, any personal data that it held to the people to whom it belonged. It had records of where people's deceased children were. It refused to give it to them. So we're saying that 
exact opposite needs to happen. These investigations are for the survivors, and as I said before, they're in relation to forced family separation. And so that needs to be at the very forefront. Another thing that we recommend is that the independent panel be able to hold public hearings of people's testimony in an unchallenged way. Of course, there will be limitations on what people can say. They may not be able to name people who are living, who they allege to be, uh, to have wronged them, possibly. That, that, those legal issues are for the independent panel to figure out. But we can see from Canada, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there, that if you don't want to be cross-examined, that doesn't mean you don't have a right to speak publicly. The public hearings of people's testimony in a comfortable way, admittedly, where there may still be some limitations, are extremely important. And to date, in the Republic, people have been forced into confident, confidential proceedings, um, even where they might want to speak publicly and inform the public of what happened to them. And finally, we recommend that when legislation is being brought forward for the statutory inquiry, that will also require new rules of procedure. That will be a statutory instrument. And we have recommended ensuring in that statutory instrument that all victims are presumed to be core participants and therefore afforded full access to the proceedings and representation albeit victims usually in public inquiries are represented in groups. Um, but we know from the Heart Inquiry that victims weren't seen by default as core participants. And in the Republic of Ireland, certainly with the Mother and Baby Homes Commission, they weren't seen as core participants and have like submissions on drafts, et cetera, in the same way that the alleged wrongdoer is good. Just to pick up on that, I mean, the strength of the the strength of the independent panel is that it can organise the evidence gathering in whichever way it wants. There are no um, statutory rules that it has to ab uh, abide by. And so in the Jersey Homes Inquiry, for example, the hearing of evidence uh, in, in, in either in private or publicly, uh, that was established by the three-person panel. The panel we are recommending would be much bigger than that. But what it did was that it... It heard that evidence, that evidence was, was taken and obviously there would be anomalies in evidence. People can't remember stuff 30, 40 years ago uh, a, a very accurately. So they're not being cross-examined uh, on, on that testimony. That testimony is then gathered together and that adds to the other issue that Maeve just, recommend, just mentioned, which is the preservation and production of all rec relevant records. So that's the, the beauty of the independent panel is that it can access those all relevant records that exist. Uh, it can look through the, um, the, the, the testamentary evidence that, 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 that is there. It can add to that and it can take evidence itself uh, and pull all of that together, handing it on to the then uh, statutory public inquiry. And the statutory public inquiry will not try and enforce evidence taking from people who don't want to be uh, examined in a public inquiry. So that's the beauty of the system. The process is to enable, to, to enable us to get the maximum possible participation of people's stories, people's testimonies, and dovetail that in to the access that they have a, rightful, a right to um, in, in terms of their records. The final thing I'll say on access to records is it was the one unanimous issue right across all people that we interviewed or we took evidence from. Access to records was a priority for all. And I think anybody listening to this conversation would understand why. Okay, can I bring in Pat Sheehan, please? Sorry, Chair, I have Sorry. one more question. Okay, Emma. Thank you um, to you all for that. I just wanted to ask as well around, and I know it's in the recommendations as a, a guiding principle, I think it's in your first recommendation, in terms of um, the human rights uh, of, of victims and survivors and looking at this through human rights um, lens. And obviously we wouldn't have had these institutions and so-called homes without misogyny and basically as a... a, a 
a, a, an attitude of misogyny being normalized throughout society. Um, but I wanted to know if you were looking at this with a sort of intersectional, um, through an intersectional lens in terms of, you know, the disproportionate impact that this has had on women and girls, obviously, but then further to that disproportionate impact on, on people living with a disability and, and how much that was going to play into your your work and, and how much it did play into the rating of your recommendations. Thank you very much. That's all for me. Thanks, Emma. I'm, I'm going to hand over to Elle for that, or sorry, to May for that, because she's our human rights um, expert. But our, I mean, it's important to point out that our recommendations are built within a human rights framework. We we spent a whole day in Belfast working that out. Um, everything that we did is with AI to those gender balance, those disability balances. Our, our recommendations within that framework um, and it's spelled out in um, chapter 11 I think and then chapter 2 um, in, in detail. Um, Maeve do you want to throw any light on that and or Phil? Yeah sure um, we think that it's an extremely important job of the independent panel um, through its non-adversarial hearings is to enable the survivors to explain um, and to illuminate the full extent of the abuses, because let's face it, these gender-based and then many other forms of discriminatory abuses, they're not well recognized yet anywhere in the world. There are no European Court of Human Rights cases about forced adoption and what consent means, for example, from an institution. Um, there's very little except what we do have is survivors who understand extremely well how their human rights were violated. And that is why the independent panel process of listening to survivors in the way that they are most comfortable explaining the systems and the harms so that then the general public can be as fully informed as possible and the public inquiry can direct its investigations in the most human rights focused sensitive way possible. And we did say when we talked about the membership of both the panel um, and the inquiry, public inquiry, um, that the expertise must be human rights focused. And we mentioned um, that the inquiry panel includes specialist expertise in gender, class or ethnicity based human rights abuse, intergenerational trauma. Um, as you note in the guiding principles, we also mentioned um, focus on disability as well so you hit the nail on the head um, I think and nobody understands the intersectional nature of the abuse better than the people who suffered it yeah and I, the only thing I've got to add to that is that when we're talking about intersectionality I think we have to also add age into the equation because quite a number of the women were um, were would be considered in law to have been minors and certainly on the cusp of adulthood. And that issue of people making decisions for them is part of the intersectionality of gender, class, ethnicity, age, disability. Um, and in ethnicity, I think it's an in important one because we have to, uh, whichever way we cut it, we have to look at the issues around sectarianism as well as the issues around racism. Uh, and so that, that, that would just be my brief addition to that. Thank you. Can I bring in Pat Sheehan, please? Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to the panel for your evidence here today. And some of the testimony we've heard over the last few days has been absolutely harrowing. And I, I want to commend Michelle O'Neill for ensuring this was uh, brought into the Executive Office as soon as it was. And uh, I... I uh, acknowledge the statement on Monday uh, that steps are going to be taken as soon as possible to set up the consultative forum and the independent panel and that moves are made to preserve uh, the records if possible. So all, all of that is, is, is good news. I, uh, I, I remember speaking to you Phil and you probably don't remember this. Uh, we, we were speaking after uh, the Findings were delivered by Justice Keegan in the Ballamurphy Massacre case, and you and I were speaking outside St Peter's Cathedral afterwards, and we had a discussion 
around the, the mother and baby's home and uh, I, I, I left you after that struck by how emotional and angry you were uh, about some of the testimony you had uh, heard from some of the victims and survivors uh, in these cases and uh, you know some of some of the evidence we're hearing about babies being taken from from their mothers never to be seen again uh, victim blaming of 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 young women and girls who were victims of of rape and incest uh, you know it's just it's, it's it's almost unbelievable only we all know that it did happen and um i'm i'm highly impressed by the the uh the process that you have brought forward uh for um the the consultative forum set up representing victims uh the independent panel uh made up of experts in genealogy data archives and so on consults with the uh the consultative forum the representatives of the victims and then they in collaboration produce an evidence base for the public inquiry uh it, it, it it's so logical and it's simplicity you sort of wonder why has it never been thought of before uh and, and i want to commend you uh, on, on that um I have, I have no real questions. Um, uh, I just want to, to commend you for the work that, that you have done to this point. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure, especially knowing you personally, Phil, uh, that you just don't walk away at this stage. You'll still be involved and have a hand in somewhere along the lane. Um, so um, I suppose... What's important now is that whatever happens in the future, that it's victim-centered, uh, that victims and survivors have an input into this and uh, they don't suffer in the same way as, as victims and survivors in other abuse situations in terms of the processes that have been established, both North and South and, 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 and other parts of these islands as well. So uh, there's no question there. If, if you want to respond in some way, feel free. Thanks. The only response uh, I will make, Pat, is that I learned a long time ago never to forget any conversations that I have um, on, on, on serious issues. So I do remember that conversation. And I think one of the important, one of the important issues here is that we cannot um, I think everybody agrees that we cannot sustain a situation uh, that doesn't get really into the heart of all of the issues. Uh, whatever it takes, however, whatever the funding it takes, whatever the uh, changes in legislation that are, ne are necessary, uh, it is the imperative of the moment. And it can be so easily clouded and overtaken by other major issues of our time but also, um, and I will say this, it's it, it, it surprised me over the last few weeks how the media has misrepresented, and not purposefully, but never really tried to get inside and understand the detail of what we've attempted to do here or what we have done here. And I think, you know, when 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 we look at it, it it is unique and it is it is simple at one level, and we would wonder why it hasn't been adopted previously in other situations. I think there are good reasons for it. I don't think public inquiries are ever set up with the, um, with the, with the mindful of the needs of individuals. I think public inquiries are set up to safeguard institutions. Uh, I have a lot of academic articles where I demonstrate this, and at the moment I'm involved in the... Um, inquiry into inquiries, which is actually asking the question of why do official inquiries fail? And I think they fail because they uh, are, are often set up for the wrong reasons, whereas in this case, we are stating right from the outset that integrated approach, which starts with the experiences uh, of, 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 of the survivors and families and works through a process of evidence gathering um, 
where we get the maximum possible evidence and dovetails into a statutory inquiry will change the actual um, nature of a statutory public inquiry forever. If that could be adopted in every situation uh, of, of, serious, uh, of, of serious default, then we would, or serious fault, then I think we would see quite different complexity in the public inquiries that we have. Okay, Thank thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I bring um, Diane Dodds into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to everyone for what, what has been a very comprehensive uh, discussion. Um, the, the, the process that you have outlined is multi-layered. And the only question I have, because so much has been covered about the north-south dimension and so on, um, but the process you've, you've outlined is multi-layered. Within all of that, how confident are you that those who are responsible will be held to account? Uh well, I, I can start. Um, that's a $6 million question, um, Diane. It, it is um, going to be very challenging. Um, I, I, I do know that um, at the start of our process um, and in January, um, Eamon Martin, Prime Minister of all Ireland, did go on TV and apologise to women and children within the Catholic Church. Um, I do understand, though, that every diocesan under canon law in the Catholic Church do have their own agency and aren't actually accountable as such to him. So um, we will see how that works out. Um, we have had some of the voluntary agencies institutions contact us to say um, our files are there, you know, whenever someone is, is ready to... Um, read them, uh, particularly from Bernardo's. Um, we haven't heard anything from um, any of the other churches and um, they're maybe waiting to see um, how, wh where this goes. Um, I honestly am not a Bethan woman, so I wouldn't like to say how much people are going to be held to account. But what I can say is that I am really heartened by the commitment of the TEO and the executive office to really um, what they, to quote unquote, leave no stone unturned. Um, so I do think that this will be a very robust process. I think the independent panel will be very robust. And I think then subsequently the public inquiry will be robust. So. Um, I think through those processes, I, I am hopeful, I suppose is the best word that I use, that people will get justice and they will get truth. That's that's what I'm hopeful will happen. Phil, Maeve? Yeah, um, my, my position on it, um, it's a really important question, Diane, and I think it's one that is probably on the minds of most people, um, and it's crucial. The thing I would want, without giving a lecture on public accountability, I think that the one thing that I will say is that there are two primary forms of accountability. First is uh, personal individual accountability, holding individuals to account, um, many of whom will now have died, will not, will not you know, that they, they have passed and that's it. You know, we can still, we, you know, you can still name people and say that if those processes they they were involved in some of the worst uh, worst uh, examples, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of treatment that happened in the institutions. I'm far more, and always have been in all my work, I'm far more concerned about institutional accountability, holding institutions to account, because it's very easy for institutions, as you know well, to be able to say, oh yes, it was just one bad apple or whatever, I'm interested in demonstrating, as we have in this report, that it wasn't one bad apple or two bad apples, that these were institutional wrongs. When women are made to go on their hands and knees, eight, eight months pregnant, and scrub floors, um, you know, that is not something that's being decided by one person. That is institutionally um, a, a process that is there. So, so I'm really concerned about holding all of the institutions uh, to, uh, to account. 
whatever their, whatever their status, whether they're religious organizations or government or quasi-government organizations, holding them all to account. And the other thing I would say on that, which I think is vital, and it's an undertaking that we have made in, in addressing these issues with the families and survivors after we, uh, after we announced our report, is that the accountability goes beyond the institutions. The accountability goes to uh, the medical profession, the social work profession, all of those who served and serviced these organizations. We've been talking this afternoon about cross-border transfer. Well, cross-border transfer had to be facilitated. Uh, who facilitated it? Under what directive? It wasn't just a, a, a religious organization or any other organization moving it between their houses. This was cross-border. It was cross-jurisdictional. When uh, when, when a, 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 a woman now recounts what it was like to dress uh, um, her newborn and have that newborn taken from her arms three days after, four days after birth, and that was the last she saw of that newborn, what was the process in place that led to the acquisition of that child from her? You know, that is the, that, you know, that, that isn't just the institution. And I'm not talking here about whether the institutions profited from it, although that is an issue. That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making, that had to be facilitated. That had to be facilitated by other agencies that enacted that, uh, enabled that to happen. So one of the things that we, we tend to focus on is institutional culpability. When institutional culpability can only exist with a lot of support around it, which then brings the state into account. In other words, it's not just about the religious institutions or the quasi-religious institutions that were involved. It's about the state institutions that facilitated um, the whole process. And that goes right across the board. And I think that that is, it's, it's a really important issue. Uh, it's the relationship between personal accountability and institutional accountability and broadening the definition of institutions out to encompass all those institutions that were, were directly and in some cases indirectly but purposefully involved. And I might add, sorry, sorry just, just before I lose the train of my thought, Maeve, just, just um, are you confident, though, that the process you've outlined, Phil, will encapsulate that full range of accountability? And because at, there are many of us who watch this, um, like myself, and who are horrified that these things went on in our midst. And it, it is a great shame on our society um, that this is what happened. And in fact, I mean, I remember as a, a very young teacher being told that some of these um, training schools or whatever you want to call them um, were models of how you would actually do things. And it's a great shame um, across the, the broad spectrum of institutions here uh, across the island of Ireland, actually, not just here, um, that, that this happened and that people at some level either ignored it, justified it, or whatever they did. And I, I really think that the issue of accountability is, is really a real key one and that, that, that we'll be able to catch all in, within the, the, the process as outlined. Well, it, the, the fifth recommendation under the public inquiry's terms of reference, Diane, is to investigate issues of individual, institutional, organizational, and state departmental agent responsibility concerning the human rights violations experienced in all of the homes and their pathways and practices, including the adoption system, related institutions such as baby homes, private nursery homes, cross-border and international transfers of children and women. And what that means is that you're absolutely correct. We should not miss those who facilitated mm -hmm. that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, Mayor. If 
Oh, no, thank you very much. I would just add that using human rights law is an extremely important tool of accountability within a truth telling process like a public inquiry and an independent panel. The public inquiry will be statutorily barred from making any civil or criminal law findings of course, but that is not to say that it can't apply human rights law and human rights law offers this strict and clear and strong legal standard by which treatment of people is measured and it's about systems and it's about state responsibility and it's about failures to protect it's not really you know it's not about civil and criminal wrongdoing um, i have an online supplemental research report that's on the website of the truth recovery panel that informed all of our work where i go through uh, in quite a bit of detail the case law concerning the definition of and examples of enforced disappearance, torture and ill treatment, arbitrary detention, forced labor and servitude, serious violations of the right to respect for private and family life. And that law should be applied by, and we have said that, uh, the independent panel and the public inquiry. And the final thing I would say is that it's, we've also discussed this in chapter 11. These inquiries are in addition to the existing democratic accountability mechanisms of the state. And we have said that the independent panel must research and provide information to survivors in the public about their rights to criminal complaints, civil proceedings, inquests, and make recommendations for better functioning of those systems. And that's really important. I think we, certainly in the Republic of Ireland, I think it's been the case that almost when an inquiry like this starts up, everything else shuts down. And the police sometimes tell people, oh no, there's an inquiry, you go there. No. <laughs> the Gardaí and the PSNR, I must gather the archives as well. Um, they must do their job and coroners must do their job and people must be able to access court. And we've made a recommendation within our address, uh, number five recommendation that people be enabled to access free legal advice, to know their rights, because an inquiry is in addition, because we recognize these are gross and systematic human rights violations, it is certainly not a substitute for existing accountability mechanisms. And unfortunately, it's sometimes seen as that. And that's why the independent panel really needs to focus as well on making recommendations in relation to those existing democratic accountability mechanisms. And that's something that in Australia, for example, has been done by public inquiries. They've really researched how well people are being served by the existing accountability mechanisms. Because of course, in order for people to have been arbitrarily detained, they have to have been treated as people who didn't have the ordinary rights that everybody else has. And that's obviously terrible and needs to be rectified. And they need access to ordinary systems too. Thank you. I think there's some really important pointers in that, not just to what I mean, what you're saying, Maeve, is absolutely true. Um, and, you know, that the, the, the ordinary justice process should continue, um, but that there is a tendency to lump it all in with one thing and try to, 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 to not do it. Um, but thank you so much for your work and thank you for a really interesting discussion today and I do hope above anything that um, I know that redress is important and, and um, truth telling is important um, for women who have been through terrible, terrible experiences and, and children and young people who have grown up without their birth parent. Um, but um, I also think that accountability is massively also important. And, and I'll, I'll really be watching out for that as we progress. Thank you. And thank you. Can I bring Parik Delargi into the spotlight, please? Shane, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Parik. Yeah, no, I think the panel have answered um, most of my questions and I just wanted to thank you all again for coming on because it has been really, really thorough um, you know, the detail that you've given. And I know it's, um, you know, a topic that, that there are so many 
was really glad to hear, um, Phil, particularly what you said, and I know Deirdre and me, if you followed up on this as well, around the national archives and looking at it in an all-Ireland approach, because I think that is really important. It makes sure that, that we are able to tackle the institutions who were responsible. Um, so just to echo what, what Pat and Emma have already said, just thanks very much for coming on. Um, and I think you've given us such a, f a fantastic insight into the work that you're doing at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Park. Um, thank, thank you um, for your time this afternoon. And can I acknowledge just um, how vital this report has been uh, and how it will change lives and hopefully change the way people um, do things in the future. So can I thank uh, Deirdre, Maeve and Phil um, for your work. Uh, and I hope that we in this committee uh, can do this justice uh, and hopefully um, the executive office uh, will do more than justice in and around it because they must now proceed with urgency to fulfil the five key recommendations uh, and the 84 sub-recommendations. Uh, uh, and it is complex. There's no doubt about it. It's very complicated. Uh, and we will be looking for a robust strategy, um, a, a project management framework for delivery, uh, uh, and comprehensive engagement um, uh, and victim-centred um, delivery on all of these recommendations. Uh, uh, and thank you once again for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to all the members for listening to us today and for your really comprehensive questions. Thank you very much. And from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, members, that was um, a very in-depth um, report and briefing on, on, on this document. And I suppose it's for us now as a committee to, to see where we go from, from here. Um, it's obviously, as I say, the implementation of all the recommendations. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to be very complex. Uh, and I think probably if members would be in agreement, the first... Um, port of call is to discuss um, the recommendations and uh, the structures, the robust structures that the department need to put in place and uh, to approach this with urgency. I think that there, uh, uh, there has to be a really strong framework put in place uh, and the strategy and sequence of delivery uh, must be, uh, must be uh, I suppose, viewable. For, for all of the survivors, and that there uh, area that John raised as well in relation to communication. You know, what communication strategy is the executive office going to engage in to make sure that generally the victims and survivors feel very much part of this process and that they can, um, you know, feed into it at any given time and that they're not uh, at any stage feel um, that they're observers in, in a process that has taken place. And I think the outcome of all of this uh, for us is that we do get to the truth, that we do get justice and there is accountability. Uh, and those are the three outcomes that we need uh, uh, and as a committee, we have a, a key role to play here in, in scrutinising the work of the Executive Office. So if you're in agreement, um, can we ask for officials to come in with, you know, very soon uh, to outline uh, their proposals and how they are going to meet um, all the recommendations, the prioritisation, and again, the prioritisation around um, access to records uh, and, uh, and the preservation of those records uh, is key as well. So I think that we have to approach this with a sense of urgency as well. We are all very aware um, that there's very little time left in this mandate, but work needs to commence um, uh, and needs to be very focused. Can I come in there, Chair? Yeah. Yeah, and it was heartening to hear the statement from the Deputy First Minister on Monday saying that, that work was beginning immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's good. And, and some work can be done quite quickly, and, and, and other stuff will take a bit longer. Um, I, I suggest we, before we bring officials in, we write to the Executive Office and ask them to outline their step by step approach 
so that when officials come in, we have some information to hand so that we can interrogate them on that. Thanks. Can I ask, Chair, yes. you had said at the beginning of the meeting that that um, session wasn't being recorded by Hansard. Can I ask why that was? Because I'm, I'm, it's my own thinking that victims and survivors, obviously, who have been through um, the, this trauma and are, are living it every day, should have access to the, the written uh, report of, of the meeting this afternoon. Um, I don't know if you heard that, uh, but the Hansard resources are currently today being used uh, in relation to legislation and development of the other committees, and therefore there was no Hansard record there, but I totally agree. Now, what we do have is obviously the, the video evidence um, of, of um, all of the presentations and all of the, the, the answers that we have today. But, you know, as, as the question was taking place today, I, I, I have about 10 other questions in, in my head as well, so I think it's really important that we do get officials in pretty quickly to look at just what is the framework uh, and what is the expected time frames in and around all of this. There has to be a sense of urgency, as, as we discussed during the presentation. You know, a lot of the victims and survivors are in their later years. They need answers now. Uh, and we can't lose time uh, in relation to that. So are you happy to follow through the actions as discussed? And, uh, and definitely, Pat, yeah, I, I mean, I would expect the officials to give us an outline anyway before they would ever come to committee. Um, but it is, uh, it, it is time for them to come uh, and uh, deliver uh, their plan and how they are approaching um, these uh, delivering of these recommendations, and as, uh, as um, Professor Phil said, like there's 84 sub recommendations. This is not easy. This is complex, and it needs to start. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Just oh, sorry, Parik, I didn't see you. Go ahead. You okay? No, it was just to say. Um, you know, just on the point that there, there wasn't a note of it, I wonder could a note be taken by Hansard staff either during the rest of this week or by next week, just because I think what Emma has said is really important, you know, that there's a written record. It just makes it as accessible as possible to victims and survivors. A good point, Parik. Um, I'll, I'll make that request. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, members, can we move on now to item six in our agenda? Um, it is a departmental briefing um, regarding the travel agents coronavirus financial assistance scheme. Um, can I refer members to pages 639 to 657 of the meeting pack and pages 25 to 34 of the table pack for the relevant papers? Um, last week, stakeholders um, briefed members in relation to the Travel Agents uh, Financial Assistance Scheme. We heard, I, I suppose, very vivid and heartfelt accounts of the current plight of, of the industry and the impact of delayed support and, and how it impacted their business and also their families. Um, there's a paper summarising the main issues raised by the organisations, and that is on page uh, 644 of the meeting pack. Can I welcome um, officials to the meeting? Um, briefing us this afternoon is Siobhan Broderick, Broderick um, okay. Director of um, Equality, Rights and Identity from the Executive Office, and Mr Paul McKenna, Head of Identity and Cultural Expression Branch of the Executive Office. And first of all, can I apologise to both of you? I I'm sure you've been waiting um, for quite a while um, for us to come to this particular item in the agenda. Um, I again, I want to uh, inform you that this session is not being recorded by Hansard, but a video um, uh, will be available on the committee website. So, Siobhan and Paul, can you brief members and update them on um, the financial assistance to date? No problem. Thank you, Chair. Well, look, thanks to the committee for the opportunity to come and brief you in respect to the Travel Agents Financial Assistance Scheme. 
Uh, as the Chair has already mentioned, Paul is with me today. You have received the briefing paper on the scheme, and I apologise it might have been a bit late. And I would like to draw your attention to some of the key details within that uh, paper. The Travel Agent Scheme was one of a number of support initiatives that the Executive agreed to support vulnerable but viable businesses which had been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The need for a scheme was identified following a meeting last November between the then First Minister, Deputy First Minister, Finance Minister and representatives from the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents, a number of whom were with you last week. It was considered that the significant losses experienced by travel agents at that time and the unique uniqueness of the sector warrant, warranted a sector-specific scheme. The executive agreed the scheme. Ministers decided that the executive office should take it forward and issued a ministerial direction to this effect. It is worth noting that the executive office has no statutory or policy responsibility for travel agents or the travel sector other than the delivery of this scheme. This sector-specific scheme for travel agents was then provided by means of regulations made under the Financial Assistance Act 2009. On the 11th of March, uh, the then First Minister and Deputy First Minister announced the opening of the COVID support scheme for the travel agents experiencing difficulties as a result of the pandemic, seeking to ensure their continued viability. The Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents, ANITA, and the Association of British Travel Agents, ABDA, were notified in advance of the scheme launch so that they could inform their members. The scheme was then opened on the 19th of March for applications and then closed on the 26th of March with costs to be accrued in the 2021 financial year because that is when the money was available. Applications were made online through the Citizen Space platform with accompanying support information subsequently sub submitted to us by email. Regularly updated guidance was available online, which detailed the necessary supporting information. We received 119, 189 applications, which were assessed under the scheme. This was made up of 101 commercial premises-based applications and 88 self-employed homeworking applicants. The travel agent scheme is now finished, it's complete. Uh, so in total, we had 165 grant payments, which were made to applicants, totaling £1.208 million of which 97 applications were in, in respect of premises-based applications and 68 in respect of the self-employed home working applicants. The remaining 24 were, were rejected due to insufficient evidence of meeting the eligibility criteria, which was set out in the regulations that set up the scheme. While there's no consideration being given to a further scheme for travel agents by TEO, the executive has funded in full the Department for the Economy's Comprehensive Economic Recovery Action Plan for this financial year. The executive has also agreed the COVID recovery plan, which is, is designed to accelerate economic health and societal recovery to deliver sustainable economic development for all. So in respect of a number of the issues that were raised last week, Chair, if you don't mind, I might try to answer a couple of them. I, I obviously don't have the list that you have there, but we were trying to pick up the questions that were raised. So members queried why this scheme was undersubscribed with the allocated anticipated monies not spent. Based on figures provided by Anita, it was anticipated the overall cost of the scheme would be approximately £1.175 million. However, it was acknowledged that the overall cost could be greater as neither Anita nor ABDA have precise figures in respect of the number of self-employed homeworking travel agents here. Therefore, we were operating on the assumption that the cost of the scheme would be between £1.1 to £1.3 million, and, and that was the, bu the budget that we had. This costing, as I say, was based on Anita estimates that there would be about 100 travel agents with commercial premises and around 50 self-employed travel agents working from home here. And overall, the numbers were not too different to that provided by Anita, with 97 successful applications in respect to business premises and 68 applications in respect of self-employed homeworking applicants. The committee, I think, also asked whether TEO had resources or teams available to take forward a second scheme. So um, my team, as, as I'm sure you've gathered from the title, is the policy and legislation team. Uh, and we were asked to quickly implement the decision uh, of the executive to introduce the COVID uh, support scheme for travel agents. Given the time scale from when we started this work in late February 21 and the need to introduce subordinate legislation with costs to be accrued in the 2021 financial year, there was limited time to develop a detailed policy. Costs needed to be accrued, as already mentioned, to the 2021 financial year to utilise the COVID funding available to the executive before the end of March. 
So by way of background, the, time, the timeline for us was 22nd of February, we, we started work in respect of the scheme. The 11th of March, the executive decided to deliver the scheme, then a formal determination as required on the, under the Financial Assistance Act, which I've already mentioned, and a ministerial direction were made, and this committee, the TO committee, was informed. Uh, on the 19th of March, the regulations uh, for the scheme came into operation, a scheme was launched. The 26th of March, the scheme closed for applications, and from then we started to assess the applications with the first payments going out on the 1st of July and the final payments on the 12th of October. So, as I said, TO has no knowledge or experience of the retail sector and specifically the travel agent sector. And taking the scheme forward, we therefore engaged with colleagues in the Department of Finance and Economy and Department for Infrastructure to, do, to draw on their experience of similar support schemes and, of course, engaged with APTA. Uh, so, my team, as I said, is a policy and legislative, so we don't award grants or make similar payments. And as you know, TO, in respect of what substantive policy areas, do, do make grants. However, these are not similar in nature to the COVID grant scheme. TEO grants, I'm sure you're familiar with, are usually made to the third sector and only in respect of a policy area in respect of which TEO is responsible and has a detailed knowledge and understanding. So my team did draw on this wider experience across the department and obtain some short-term loans, short loans of staff to assist in establishing governance arrangements and to deliver the scheme. Uh, as I noted above, as the scheme is being delivered, these staff have all returned to their substantive posts. Uh, so there's no standing team in TEO to, to deliver any second scheme. So I hope that is helpful. I, I don't know if we've picked up all the questions that you asked last week, but um, we're happy to try and deal with those now. Uh, thank you, Siobhan, uh, for that. And actually, you, you've touched on a, a couple of things that I wanted to raise with you. Um, well, first of all, I still am not clear how this landed on your desk. Um, and, and can you talk the committee through the process by which support for the travel agents became a responsibility for TEO? And, and, and you clearly said that, you know, due to the timeline, there was very little time for your department to actually um, think through this scheme. And, and what we heard from the stakeholders last week was that the money that was available for the scheme was wholly inadequate um, because of just the nature of the business that they were in. They weren't in a business that could be furloughed. They were actively um, working in order to recompense um, people for travel that had already been booked. So they had to employ staff to fulfil their legal obligation and duty. Um, so, you know, they were not allowed to sell their products. There was no products to sell anyway, um, as no one was travelling. So no other sector um, had to do this. And, and therefore, they're in a position now that their business is still not up and running at, at full pelt. Probably money won't come into their business until Easter, May of this year, when people start really travelling uh, at, you know, uh, at, at momentum rather than... Um, than what is happening now at the minute. So they desperately need more support, financial support going forward. They need uh, uh, some kind of recovery uh, grant scheme, winter recovery uh, to get them over this, you know, probably um, six, six, eight, nine, ten um, weeks. Uh, uh, and But I still don't think that it's, it's the area of the, the executive office. But can you talk me through, first of all, why it landed um, and the fact that you didn't have time to kind of investigate what type of scheme and their particular situation. And now that this further request for further financial support has come in, what um, the executive office uh, should uh, and could do to help support this industry going forward? Well, I suppose I, I will say again that TEO doesn't have statutory or policy responsibility for travel agents or the retail sector. But First Minister and Deputy First Minister with the Finance Minister did meet with Anita at the end of last year and obviously were cognizant of the case that they made for, for support. Uh, the executive decided and agreed that a scheme would be put in place and then ministers asked the executive office to take that forward, which we did. Uh, but as again, as I've said, 
we, we, we did that quickly because the financial the finance available was only available at that point in time in the last financial year, so it's 2021. So the scheme had to be launched and delivered to allow us to accrue the money into 2021. Uh, and we did that and the money has accrued into the last financial year. Um, but we did it on the basis of the figures that were provided by Anita and ABDA in respect of the number of travel agents that were in the sector. Uh, we had limited time to investigate that other than in contact with ABDA. Uh, the amounts were, the £10,000 was consistent. That was the £10,000 award that was available for travel agents who have um, premises. That's consistent with the Small Business Support Grant. And the three and a half grand was consistent with the newly employed support grant scheme. Um, and the figures, uh, when you combine the, the numbers of travel agents, given the Anita estimates, and the amount of money available allowed us to uh, deliver 1.2 million of support into the sector last year. In, in relation, uh, Siobhan, to the request by the industry um, for further financial support, what are your observations considering that the executive office um, it's currently sitting within their responsibility uh, for this ex uh, this this uh, scheme that um, well this existing scheme I know it's now closed but um, given that it's still resting um, in the executive office, what's your recommendation? I suppose I, I would again say that TO has no statutory or policy responsibility for travel agents. Uh, so we're not familiar with the sector. We're not familiar with the high street. Um, we did deliver the, the scheme given the decision made by the executive and by ministers. And we have completed that. And as I said already, we don't have any standing team that is familiar with the sector and is ready to deliver another scheme. I, I would obviously say that the executive has taken on, made unprecedented support for all of the sectors that are impacted by the consequences of COVID-19. The Department for the Economy has led in the delivery of business-related support, providing more than £500 million of much-needed funds uh, to support local businesses. Uh, and I understand the travel agent sector would have been able to avail of some of that support. Um, and, that, and there was also then, obviously, uh, earlier this year, support provided by the Department of Finance in respect to top-up payments. Okay, thank you. Can I um, hand over to John Stewart now, please? Bring him into the spotlight. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Sean and Paul. Um, you can probably see my camera's not working today, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, the Chair's covered, I suppose, most of the, the concerns and issues that I would have had. And look, I am entirely sympathetic that this ended up in TO's hands and that it's not something that ordinarily you would ever do and hopefully you don't have to do it again and it ends up anything like this will end up in the right department next time around. I just want to dive into the, um, the figures um, in terms of those who want to be unsuccessful. So when you mentioned numbers, I think it was, I can't remember exactly how many were unsuccessful. 24. So good, how many was it? 24? 24, yes. Yeah. So uh, I know, 20. I know 120 odd. So 189 applications, 165 okay. successful. So okay. 24 were not. Um, so four in respect, I think, premises. Right. And there was 20 in respect of the home workers. So obviously they were unable to provide us the information to meet the eligibility criteria set out in the scheme. But as I also said, we made every effort to give them the opportunity. Like we went back numerous occasions and that's why sometimes it took us quite a while to get through the scheme. We did go out of our way to give every opportunity to applicants to meet the eligibility criteria. Okay. Yeah, no, that was that was basically the, the, the point of my question was just to see if they had that opportunity and, and the right of appeal. It does sign them that you were given that they were given all that. I mean, I just wanted to dive into it. Though, what, why did they fall down? Was it they weren't able to prove the premises for the most part, or they weren't able to prove that they were vulnerable in terms of business status, or what was, if you had to, you know, give a, an overview of those. Yeah, surely. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, many thanks for the question. I mean, it, it actually depended on the case. Um, okay. Our eligibility criteria was set out in the regulations, and some people wouldn't have been able to meet, say, for instance, um, as you mentioned, if it was a commercial premises, they wouldn't have got a commercial premises if they couldn't have shown they, were, they had an element of non-domestic rates 
applicable okay. to the premises, and that was a premise one. Others may have failed, say, by failure to demonstrate they were an actual travel agent. We have a definition of travel agent, you know, member of a travel regulatory body or the holder of a, an ATOL license or some other qualification. Some applicants couldn't prove that. So they weren't meeting our definition of travel agents as well. Or, I mean, another way of showing your travel agent, you had a commercial agreement with a parent company that had the same qualifications. So that's a couple of the reasons why people wouldn't have been able to meet it or wouldn't have been able to show us if they had sufficient bank transactions that they were operating as a travel agent throughout the eligible period. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks very much, Paul. Appreciate it, Sean. Thank you, That's all I have. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I um, ask Pat Sheeran to um, ask his question? Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to both of you um, for coming today. Um, like John and, and Sinead, you know, I'm at a loss as to why this scheme wasn't handled by the Department of the Economy. Uh, and I suppose I have to commend the Executive Office for taking it and for consulting with other departments, finance, infrastructure, Department of Economy itself in terms of delivering this, given that you had no experience previously, and also for consulting with the APTA uh, organisation. Uh, I suppose what I really want to know is, given, given the evidence we heard last week, and I'm sure you're very much aware of that, I suppose what did this scheme set out to achieve, and was there any assessment or evaluation done to uh, see if, if, if what the, the, the desired outcome actually was achieved, uh, in that uh, people were able to keep their businesses going uh, with support from the government? Thanks. The, the underpinning policy was to support viable but vulnerable businesses uh, to keep them going through COVID. Um, but there was the, 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 the scheme was delivered under ministerial direction. So given the time scales, there was no detailed analysis or a, an economic appraisal. And uh, given the absence of evidence, you know, there was no value for money assessment that was made by the department. So, so there's no real benchmark pad against which we could determine whether it has delivered on that policy. Uh, but I would say the figures in respect of the applications were similar to those that Anita gave us at the start, as I mentioned in the presentation. Uh, and one of the criteria for the scheme was that you did intend to continue in business. So maybe an, a fair assumption is that those businesses do intend to stay in business and, and operate forward. And were you aware, Siobhan, that uh, travel agents faced unique difficulties that other businesses didn't face? So for example, I mean, they had to keep their business open. Uh, they had to continue uh, keeping employees in work. But it was mainly taking bookings and then cancelling them and then refunding money that had already been paid up. They weren't actually uh, bringing in any income at all. Was, was that yeah. sort of those unique circumstances taken into account? Well, I think those circumstances were, were those that were sort of pleaded by the sector when they met with ministers at the end of last year, which I, which I assume led to, to the decision to, to take forward the scheme. Um, like I, I wouldn't really want to comment on whether it's unique or not. I don't know enough about the retail sector and the, the wider economic sector to comment on that, but clearly there were challenges within the sector. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I have uh, no one else indicating that they want to speak on this, unless anybody wants to put up their hand at the minute. No? Okay. Oh, Christopher Stolfert. Okay, Christopher, in the spotlight, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to ask one very basic and brief question, because unfortunately I missed some of the, the exchange at last week's meeting. Um, you said in your presentation, uh, that it was an executive committee decision that the, the scheme would reside within uh, the department for the executive office. Um, and I understand why some people think that might look peculiar, but was there any other, did any a government minister on the executive objective residing with the, the executive office at the time the decision was made? Not that I'm aware. 
Christopher, no, yeah. not, not that I'm aware. I think it's important to put that on the record, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher. And uh, can I thank um, Siobhan and Paul for your update and briefing? Um, uh, and I think um, the members of the committee need to just reflect on um, your, your briefing for the next steps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, members, um, I think it's very clear that the Executive Office uh, have indicated they have uh, no statutory or policy powers in relation to uh, delivering for this particular sector. Uh, if members were in agreement... Mommy, something came on the door. Hello? Sorry. Okay. Uh, if members were in agreement, um, would you agree that we write to Minister Gordon Lyons asking that his uh, department resume um, statutory and, and policy responsibility for this uh, for the travel uh, agents uh, and uh, to look at uh, developing further financial package to support this industry as uh, they go through um, the winter. Um, uh, if, if, if members were in agreement, uh, we will get that processed as quickly as possible. I do believe that there is an onus of responsibility with the Department for Economy um, to, to uh, engage with this sector and deliver for this sector. Chair, I, I, I have no principal objection to us as a committee writing to the Economy Minister to ask him what additional support his particular department proposes in relation to uh, support for the, the travel industry. Um, what I would say is that this, the decision that this responsibility would reside with TEO was taken at an executive level, and I don't know if decisions around further such schemes would need to be taken at an executive level rather than the impetus being entirely placed upon the Minister for the Economy. Having said that, I see no harm in writing to him in a general sense to ask what support his department proposes to bring forward because this responsibility had previously resided with TEO um, and TEO, <coughs> excuse me, this particular scheme had resided with TEO and TEO now has uh, sort of concluded that scheme just to find out what additional support is coming. I think that's fair enough. I think, Christopher, from our understanding of conversations that have had have been had is that the Department for Economy um, had very little resource for an, an added financial package to, to actually be managing it. Obviously, uh, the situation has changed. Uh, most um, most uh, coronavirus support packages are now complete. Therefore, one would assume um, that they now have a, a, a bit of brand, bandwidth and that can deal with this um, particular industry and their specific needs going forward. So I think the, the, the circumstances have changed uh, and therefore possibly the ability to deliver um, for this industry, um, they will have capacity now. Um, so I think it's back over to um, Minister Lyons uh, to, to resume his responsibility uh, and I'm sure he has the capacity to do so. All I'm saying is that previous decisions around this scheme were taken at an executive level. So I suppose what I'm saying is, on occasion where the work of one committee cuts across the work of another, it may actually be worth, I know this hasn't been hand started, but it may actually be worth you as the chair of this committee, writing to the chair of the economy committee, who I think is still uh, Dr Archibald, and highlighting this issue was brought up at our committee it may be of interest to you to raise it with your minister. All I'm saying is that clearly the decision in terms of responsibility around this scheme and which department would take a lead on it was taken at an executive level. What we've had is a briefing on the outworking of a scheme that is now closed, but which ultimately, I, I do agree, I think ultimately um, economy would be a better fit for these sorts of issues. So it may be worth you as the chair of this committee writing to the chair of the economy committee just to say we've had this conversation here's this issue here are these concerns we think that this falls more within the remit of your committee than with ours 
and it may be worth you raising them with the minister and giving us an update on any response that you get back. Okay, thank you, Christopher. We'll take that as another action. So we will write to um, uh, Keeve Archibald and we will uh, write to the minister as well. So thank you. Okay. Um, moving on now to item number seven, um, approach to the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, we have um, a, an oral briefing from the Research and Information Services. So um, if I can refer to members to their uh, packs, uh, page 658 to 684 for the relevant papers. Uh, and can I remind members of, of the committees uh, wish that the needs and perspectives of Northern Ireland are taken into account when decisions are being made by the UK or the EU that affect Northern Ireland. The committee's engagement North and South, East, West and with the EU are part of the advocacy for Northern Ireland. Um, for your information, the Deputy Chair and myself will meet the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee on Monday uh, and I will also be attending the Inter-Parliamentary Forum at Westminster on the 10th of December as part of this process. So can I welcome um, into the meeting um, Emma Dello Perry, from the re uh, Research Officer from um, the Research and Information Services. Hello Emma and um, I seek your forgiveness for the long wait also, um, but uh, I can ever refer members to um, a table on page 674 of the meeting pack, which actually outlines EU's um, protocol um, action um, one to four against the UK's command paper and the proposals the EU have issued uh, or republished in um, July. So you can refer to, to those parts uh, of the papers that Emma will discuss now. Okay, Emma, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and apologies. I, I'm not able to switch my camera on. I'm, I seem to be having uh, camera difficulties as long, along with everyone else today. Um, so, as the committee will be aware, in July 2021, the UK government published its command paper on the protocol. Around the same time, the EU had published a set of non-papers to address concerns about the functioning of the protocol. Since then, the EU has published a further set of non-papers and proposals which sit, sit alongside and in some cases replace the earlier set. This briefing, taken together with part one, which the committee has already seen, focuses on the run-up to the issue of the command paper, the non-papers issued by the EU and the initial response from the UK. Obviously, negotiations are still going on, so this presentation will focus on the proposals which have been made, discuss some key points and conclude by reviewing emerging themes. Uh, as the Chair has mentioned, there is a, a, a table in your pack which does try and summarise and compare the proposals. It is a very brief summary and they are lengthy proposals, so just to bear that in mind. Um, so to start with the command paper uh, issued in July, the majority of the proposals are contained within Section 5. In brief, the command paper argued for an expansion of the concept of goods at risk, using what has been referred to as the honesty box approach. So what this means is GB traders whose goods are ultimately bound for Ireland would have to declare it, in which case EU customs procedures would apply. A similar process is recommended for SBS checks, and that would be or could be underpinned by additional agreements because of the sensitivity of the issue. In terms of VAT and excise, the government sought more flexibility to set rates in Northern Ireland, but allow for safeguards and consultation measures to deal with risks around distortion of the market. In terms of enforcement, the government uh, is seeking to underpin the arrangement with stronger data, sh data sharing and law, law enforcement cooperation. When looking at uh, NI to GB access or unfettered access, the government was seeking to dispense with an agreement to replace export declarations with uh, data collection mechanisms by removing the requ requirement for export declarations entirely, except in the narrow case of specifically controlled goods. Uh, a dual regulatory regime was proposed where goods can circulate freely in Northern Ireland as long as they meet UK or EU standards and those which go on to the EU are dealt with as outlined above. In terms of medicines, the government sought to remove these from the scope of the protocol entirely. Uh, and in terms of subsidy control or state aid, 
this would be dealt with using the processes which have been agreed in the trade and corporate cooperation agreement. On governance, the UK argued for the removal of Article 12, 4 to 7 of the protocol, which gives EU institutions enforcement rights, and they sought to replace that with a governance framework closer to that in the TCA. The EU's proposals in October updated and in some cases replaced those which had been issued earlier in the summer, so they are taken together here. In terms of customs and VAT, the EU had said that more evidence was needed of the problems that the UK had raised. The October proposals included an, an expansion. Uh, the, the October proposals from the EU, sorry, included an expansion of existing definitions and facilitations, including um, the definition of goods not at risk. Taken together, these proposals would ensure goods consumed in Northern Ireland would fall within the not at risk criteria. In terms of the EU response on SPS checks, the non-paper had, had offered facilitations or referred to available derogations in terms of assistance dogs, the identification and transport of products and of animal origins and animals themselves. In October, this was developed into a bespoke solution for GBNI retail goods, which would allow simplified access, but this is subject to certain criteria and conditions including, for example, production requirements meeting EU standards in some cases, uh, specifically mentioned were chilled meat products, uh, data sharing and border control posts. <coughs> On medicines, the EU solution was to allow compliance functions for Northern Ireland medicines to be based in Great Britain or brought through Great Britain without additional authorisation. These proposals also deal with safety features and use of investigational medical products and uh, responded to industry concerns about things like labelling for uh, medicines that would be in Northern Ireland and or in the EU. The most significant change from the EU was in terms of engagement with uh, stakeholders from Northern Ireland and by stakeholders I'm including a really broad range of individuals from um, parliamentarians uh, to uh, business leaders and people like that. Previously, the EU stance in terms of issues like input into legislation, uh, Northern Ireland representation in the bodies of the protocol and updating Northern Ireland on changes to legislation which applied under the protocol had been to advise that uh, Northern Ireland institutions should really work within the existing structures and through the UK government. The proposals that it made in October um, included, for example, that the Commission would, would now establish a, web a website which would track these changes to legislation which apply to Northern Ireland by virtue of the protocol, and also include links to public consultations on relevant proposals. In addition, the Commission proposed more forums for discussion, uh, more structured discussion between officials, and a Northern Ireland specific substructure to the uh, UK-EU Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. Equally, the Commission proposed that more information would be published on the meetings of protocol bodies, um, which at the minute are, aren't very widely publicised. Um, so, to move on quite quickly to some key points, Article 16 has been discussed again more recently, um, but the command paper actually suggested a reluctance to use this procedure. This is because, uh, in the view of the UK government, the dispute resolution process uh, which follows is untested and the use of Article 16 in itself is meant to be limited to specific safeguarding actions which deal with specific issues. So the government has actually expressed a preference to rely on other articles in the protocol which allow for the protocol to be updated or replaced by later agreement between the parties and that will, in, in again from the UK government perspective, that will allow the, the fundamental reform that it, it has been calling for since uh, earlier in the summer. However, much depends on the final shape of the agreement. The government has been clear that all options remain on the table. Uh, Article 16 is back in the news again over the past couple of days. But um, this, so we'll just have to wait and see. In terms of the role of the ECJ, again, that one is difficult to predict. Um, under the protocol, the court has power, for example, to interpret questions of EU law and hear complaints. There is potential for what they call reachback. Um, which is 
EU law still limiting actions of the UK after the uh, UK's exit from the EU. Um, this is especially relevant in the context of state aid. The, e uh, sorry, the UK wants to take a different approach to state aid to that adopted by the EU, but to a certain extent there are concerns about the protocol limiting that in the sense that subsidised businesses in GB trade with Northern Ireland and that could bring the aid scheme itself within the scope of EU rules and thus possibly into the ambit of the ECJ. So the UK government is seeking to remove the jurisdiction entirely and has made that clear over the summer and the autumn. Equally, the EU has historically been quite averse to the idea of any other court interpreting EU law. And there certainly have been um, no comments that this is something that the EU is, is considering um, relaxing. It's a very, it's a very focused part of, of the EU's position. Another important point that ha has been the engagement with the Northern Ireland stakeholders. The opportunity for a Northern Ireland specific substructure in the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly is something that is likely to be of considerable envy to the other devolved legislatures, given their expressed desire to engage with the PPA itself. Uh, importantly, the size of the UK delegation at 35 representatives means that the opportunity for even one or two more voices articulating the interests of Northern Ireland is arguably quite valuable. So to move on and uh, look at emerging themes, um, the first is implementation and stability. It has been clear from the evidence given in various parliamentary committees that, especially to businesses, stability and planning are key. Now negotiations are obviously ongoing and that carries inherent instability but operating under the assumption that there will be changes coming out of the negotiations. The question of implementation arises. We've seen evidence that timescale uncertainty and lack of foreknowledge meant businesses struggled initially. Implementation of any new solution to the protocol should ideally respond to these critiques. Equally, there has been significant investment by all stakeholders in implementing the protocol to date, so ideally solutions would build on or repurpose that investment. Uh, and on top of that, consideration could be given to potential mitigation for any disruption as arrangements fed into place. Another theme is constitutional issues and transparency. So the proposals for greater engagement with Northern Ireland stakeholders, publication of legislation and the PPA substructure can be seen as refle reflecting concerns about the democratic deficit in the protocol. It remains to be seen with the uh, whether the sorry, agreed arrangements will attract widespread support, but there will likely be a lot of quite dispersed activity in the protocol bodies, the PPA and other forums that could benefit from some form of centralised scrutiny in order to be transparent to the average person. In terms of planning for the future, um, if the protocol is fundamentally altered in its operation, the question of a vote on consent arises. The UK government uh, in the command paper referred to its belief that Northern Ireland should have been given a vote on whether to enter into the protocol rather than give consent after the fact. The operation of any new arrangements will at best have two years to get working before the scheduled vote on consent arises in 2024. In the event that consent is withheld, the question of alternatives will arise. So in any scenario, not saying that anyone is more likely than another, work done around the implementation of the protocol and lessons learned from that will be useful in the future as well as making it more transparent in the present. So I, I realise I've uh, cantered through a very complex issue there. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to deal with any questions. Uh, thank you Emma uh, and that's the understatement of um, the day. Um, complex <laughs> issues regarding um, our position. Um, in the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, but just Emma, I wonder, can you um, talk me through um, what actually happens if Article 16 is triggered? Yes, absolutely. So, um, Article 16, if triggered, that would start with notification. So if the EU or the UK are considering taking what's called safeguard measures, the proposing side should inform the other side through the joint committee and without delay. 
after that, there will be a consultation. Both parties have agreed that they will try to work through the Joint Committee and find what they call a commonly acceptable solution. If no solution is found, the proposing the, the, the side that wishes to uh, use the safeguards can't implement them until one month after they have notified the other side, unless the consultation has you know, concluded before that uh, and, and an agreed arrangement has been, re has been reached. After that, the proposing side must continue to notify the other what measures they are putting in place and all relevant information. And then every three months, the safeguarding measures will be discussed in joint committee with a focus on ending them and or limiting their scope. There are additional steps in there. Um, so if the safeguard measures create an imbalance, uh, the other side may take proportionate rebalancing measures. These are have to be limited to what is strictly necessary and uh, priority will be given to measures that, as they say, least disturb the functioning of the protocol. Um, but that they could also, <laughs> if the rebalancing measures didn't work or if they weren't um, satisfactory, it could be referred to the withdrawal agreements dispute resolution process, which would involve an independent arbitration panel. So with all of those very complex mechanisms in place, Article 16, it, it, it just, it, it's not one of those things that happens overnight. It's a very long and drawn out process. Okay, Emma, and I, I suppose what is clear, um, triggering Article 16 will pushes into a prolonged period of trading instability uh, and that's detrimental to businesses uh, in Northern Ireland, businesses on the island of I Ireland uh, and also uh, businesses east-west as well. So it, it, it's not a good outcome for, for anybody. But can I also just ask for a wee bit of clarification um, in and around point uh, 4.1. Um, it's to try and get a better understanding of, of one issue of serious concern, like just why is there now a major conflict over the role of the European Court of Justice in regards to Northern Ireland? And, and, and two, we know, is this uh, an ideological uh, issue of sovereignty, which somehow maybe got con ignored uh, when the protocol was no first negotiated by Lord Frost and the Prime Minister? Or is there a really practical reason why this is now so important? Um, because I, I don't think it's very clear, uh, and maybe you have a, a better understanding of, of why this area has now um, risen as a, a, as a key area of concern? Um, I'm not sure what led to this, uh, this issue becoming a key area of concern. It certainly did become important um, following the publication of the command paper, but it, in all fairness, it's not the first time it's been mentioned. Um, I think uh, quite early on, um, uh, in, in the Brexit or in the EU exit process, this was raised by one of the committees. Yes, sorry, I found it here. Um, this was raised by one of the committees in the in and around 2018, and they did publish a report on it. I I didn't look too deeply into the thread, the, the sort of logical thread of that, uh, and connect it up to the command paper. But I'm more than happy to go back and take a look at, at and and see if I can sequence the, the steps any better for you. And that would be really helpful, Emma, because I just want to, you know, understand better the practicality. You know, is there practical reasons why this is so important? Um, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and is it so important that, you know, that the UK government would trigger Article 16 over it? Is it, is it that red line because of, of, of some major issue in relation to, to trading here? And then the other question, is a quick question, on, on point uh, 4.21, the issues around reachback, can you provide some examples of where this might be a real point of contention or that you're aware of? 
Um, I, th I think the example that's been used in um, some of the literature about it is, uh, is that of a car factory. So if a car factory in, say, Darlington is subsidised and those cars are then sold in um, Northern Ireland, the question, the question of um, impacting the, the, the market and impacting the EU, EU's market will arise. And the EU has issued two statements which sort of clarify their position on when um, state aid uh, would become more uh, would affect state aid rules would affect the UK but the UK has, has sort of said those explanations aren't com particularly comforting and aren't particularly clear um, but again this is a very in-depth in issue and something I'd be happy to take away and provide a more focused briefing on. Emma, that would be really helpful as well. It's just, you know, if, uh, just the practicality of some of those, you know, examples would, mm -hmm. would kind of um, clarify some of the issues uh, in and around it. Can I um, ask John Stewart to come into the spotlight? Is he there? Okay, he's not there. Has anybody else any questions they would like to raise? I have no hands up here. Okay, thank you very much, Emma. Um, that, that's very informative. I, I suppose if you could um, give me uh, some leeway, I, I suppose to make a, a bit of a, a political statement in, in relation, a political observations in relation to to the paper. Um, one of the comments quoted by Lord Fre Frost suggests that uh, he wishes to add to the democratic deficit. And I suppose, you know, um, th th that's important um, for, for all of us. But it really feels like, um, you know, that excluding the Assembly from engaging with EU institutions is, is not the way to go about um, engaging in a, 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 the democratic uh, deficit uh, and, and, you know, to be cynical about it, you know, is, is, there, <laughs> is the UK government afraid of, of maybe Northern Ireland's voice um, diverging from, from their own? And the other point is um, I, I really find it um, difficult to accept when we talk about both sides of this community. When it comes to uh, the protocol, it's multi-layered. There are many sides um, to this issue uh, and around. There's a range of backgrounds and there's a range of outlooks. And, and I would add that the business community are a key community um, in, in, in this discussion uh, and, uh, and no one in um, the, the, the business community that I have spoken to and I've spoken to many, many business representation bodies are actually um, anxious to trigger Article 16, are anxious to scrap the protocol in any shape, form or, um, uh, or fashion. Uh, and one of the, the, the main things um, that the business community are really concerned about is that stability um, within um, the, 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 the economic environment. It is key for, for investment, for future investment, uh, and, and this ongoing spat that is actually happening between the UK and the EU it is detrimental to business and, uh, and business owners and investors coming here. We have a unique opportunity here to, to um, overcome some of the obstacles uh, and then get down to the business of selling our unique trading position uh, within the context of, of Ireland and the UK and the European Union. So that's my political um, observation. Uh, uh, and, and thank you for, for listening. And thank you, Emma, um, for your briefing this afternoon, and sorry for delaying you. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Chair, I think we have a quorum. Can we just check that Everyone John on. is actually there? Uh, John Stewart, if you're still there, can you? 
let us know because we may have lost our quorum. Hodrick has been dropping in and dropping out, so if he comes back in and John returns to us, then we'll have quorum to make a decision. Um, otherwise, we, we don't. No, we don't. We don't have a quorum. No, uh, I, I know Podrick has been dropping in and dropping out. If he comes back in, um, John was. Yeah, I'm back as John, but in case you're looking for the oh, one. Sorry, yes, John. We we thought you were gone there for a while. Oh no, I'm still here, just about. <laughs> okay. So if we get Podrick back in, then. Still only four, though, isn't it? Yeah, we've only got four. It's okay. We, we, we can take evidence, but we can't make a decision. Um, if, if Podrick comes back in, then we can. Pat, are you contacting Podrick? I'm trying to, yeah. I said I'd reception in the northwest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said I'd reception in the northwest. Shocking. <laughs> no connectivity at all. <laughs> mm. Are there decisions we need to take? Well, we're just discussing the forward work programme, really, and, um, you know, most of the correspondence is just to note. So um, maybe we should move Press to correspondence on, yeah. and just note the correspondence and we'll come back to the forward work programme. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, members, if we take item number nine, correspondence, and, and um, there are 12 items of correspondence, pages 692 uh, to 913 in the meeting pack, and I'll just quickly run through them. 9.1, European Commission, press remarks by Vice President Marcus Sekovic uh, following the meeting with David Frost on the 12th of November. 9.2, the UK Government press release following David Frost's meeting with Marcus Sekovic uh, on the 12th of November. Um, uh, um, members, it was agreed at last week's meeting to invite um, Vice President Sekovic and Lord Frost to brief the committee in relation to the current EU um, exit developments. 9.3 is the Hansard report from Lord Frost's statement uh, on the 10th of November. 9.4 is the Executive Office response uh, regarding Quays uh, following Junior Minister session on the 29th of September uh, regarding labour market sh shortages. And um, uh, 9.5, the Executive Office Joint Consultative uh, Working Group, 18th of October uh, 2021. 9.6 was the Executive Office Victims and Survivors Board appointment of new members. Um, uh, again, um, it, I would be seeking members' agreement, which we can't actually do now, to ask for a terms of reference uh, in relation to these appointments, because I, I, I just don't understand what the terms of reference are, and I think it's pretty important just after we've heard uh, the briefing earlier. So um, 9.7, a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Finance and the Executive Office in respect to their responsibilities for reform of the civil service, and 9.8, EU Affairs Manager, UK Government reports the European Union Withdrawal Act and common frameworks. The common framework that might uh, uh, that might have come to this committee, um, equal treatment, is not regarded as necessary between Great Britain. Wide equality law covers most of the framework areas, and there are shared international obligations with Great Britain and Northern Ireland are subject to. The situation uh, will remain under um, review. Um, item 9.9 .9 in correspondence, the Northern Ireland Community Relations Council annual report um, counts for year end at the 31st of uh, March 2021. Um, 9.10 is the English language teaching uh, sector in Northern Ireland. It was agreed in last week's meeting to write to Foil International to provide further written evidence uh, to the committee to consider its uh, deliberations on the matter. 9.11 is what I refer to in my um, 
ch uh, Chair's business earlier on is um, the reports from the Royal Irish Academy on higher education uh, futures uh, and, the, and the discussion papers uh, contained therein. And 9.12 is the House of Commons or House of Lords, beg your pardon, Select Committee on the Constitution. So um, if members are happy, can we just note uh, the correspondence as laid before us? Agreed. Okay. Um, the forward work programme, there are a couple of areas in the forward work programme um, that are being swapped around just due to um, availability of, of speakers, etc. Um, but I, I suppose if we write out to members uh, and um, ask them uh, for their agreement, um, it's the only thing that we can do now in the absence of a quorum. Are members happy enough to do that? Agreed. Okay. So moving on um, to any other business, uh, have members any other? Just, just mm -hmm. say, Chair, about um, uh, the, the visit to Maze Long Cash oh, um, sorry. on Thursday. Okay. Uh, so um, just next week. Yeah, just uh, a point to note. Um, our committee have decided, uh, have agreed to visit the Mays Long Cash, uh, and the date is next Thursday between 10 a.m. and midday. So if members can uh, confirm uh, with the clerk if they're available to attend, and also, most importantly, do they require transport, or will members be happy enough to go directly um, to the Mays uh, and meet up uh, uh, as a group? at 10 a.m. Where, where are we meeting exactly? Where is the entrance? It's, uh, it'll be at gate three, um, and then they'll provide transport around the site. Okay. So uh, it's at gate three, and transport will be provided, and we'll be taken around the site. Um, so that's our bus run for next. We, we now have a quorum. So we'll bring carry out have with we, us, or what? Hey? Bring a carry out. <laughs> Where, wherever it floats your boat. Perhaps more familiar with the, the location maybe than some of the rest of us. So <laughs> down there really. All right, I'll give the guide a tour. <laughs> okay. Um, so we 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 are uh, we've got a quorum now. Christopher has joined us again. So so if members would just get back to the clerk and um, just confirm your attendance and whether you want to uh, meet at the maze or whether we require transport here to bring per people to the maze. I know from myself, my own perspective, I just go directly there because it would be just a roundabout to come up here to go uh, in the other direction. So I'm sure it'll probably be the same for a lot of the other members. Do you need a, do you need a passport to meet that <laughs> so, Christopher, I'm sure you'll supply. <laughs> At least check. <laughs> okay, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, uh, just members, just to give now that we we have, we have a quorum here, just um, members to note that the the Senate Special Select Committee has informed the committee that regrettably there's it's no longer possible to find a time to meet with the committee in Dublin in advance of the publication, which we suspected anyway. Um, uh, 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 their publication of the report is on the 9th of December. However, they have. Um, uh, issued uh, an informal invite uh, that we might meet with them after uh, the new year, so we can uh, look at that later on. Uh, also, um, in, in regards to the formal or forward work programme, officials have requested to move their briefing on the refugee integration strategy from next week, the 24th, to the 1st of December, and this is due to a draft strategy for consultation um, uh, that is going to be published on the 29th of November, which officials will be able to present in greater detail at that meeting. Uh, you know, while I, I, I get their point, I, I think it would be more um, fitting or more ideal that the department involves the committee in the development of the strategy rather than after the consultation uh, is published. But we are where we are with it. The committee will be brief on the consultation responses and its views sought before the final strategy is agreed. Also, members, can you please note that the legacy of the, the conflict briefing um, has now been moved to the 15th of December in place of the Centre of Cross uh, border Studies Briefing, which has been moved to the 8th of December. So we're doing a wee bit of jigging there. 
So, um, and this is really just to uh, facilitate uh, pre presenter availability. So, if members are content with the changes, okay, and if members are, are happy with the, the, the remainder of the forward work program, um, that's it. So, okay, um, any other business? No? Okay. The date and time and place of the next meeting will be Wednesday the 24th of November at 2pm back in room 30. Thank you. And thank, thank, you, thank you. Okay. And, and thank you to the clerk and all the staff. As usual, you have been very efficient. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.